right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And we are going to have a very fun Friday night with a little stream titled, Have You Ever Heard of Al Bielik? Time travel, aliens, and my general take is a government psyop. And so I was thinking about a topic to do tonight. Uh, and I had a few in mind, some more serious stuff, kind of the usual rigmarole. But I thought, you know, something more fun might be in order. And I was thinking about this rabbit hole that when I was a kid kind of went down. And that is this Al Bielik, Preston Nichols, the Montauk Project, the Philadelphia Experiment, um, you know, the, the Phoenix Project, all these different things. If they ring a bell to some of you, then you already know what I'm talking about. And you probably already know what to expect for tonight's stream. Because we're just basically going to listen to a gentleman known as Al Bielik, who um, died in 2011. And I got into his stuff in like 2010, right before he passed away. And it was about how he traveled through time and that he was part of the famous Philadelphia experiment in the 1940s, I believe 1942. He claimed Tesla was working on it. Einstein had his hand in it. And basically they were experimenting with invisibility cloaking and that uh, the Philadelphia, the ship, the USS Philadelphia got stuck in hyperspace and he and his brother experienced time travel into multiple different centuries, of which one of them was they were in the 40s, and then they would arrive in 1983 at a place called Montauk, in Montauk, New York, and there is a military base there in Montauk, and um, according to Al Bielik and some of the stuff that we're going to be getting into, he claimed that this Montauk, that they were also doing time travel there, and so he had all these different discussions about uh, the original men in black were actually indicative of some of the research going on underground at the Montauk base there in New York. Um, he talked about mind control. Again, he said that there was an attempt by the government to program young men for mass shootings, and this was to cause more chaos in the U.S., all this different stuff. Now, Again, we'll get into all these different things. I am not supporting any of it. This stream is not supporting it. I do not believe in aliens, uh, personally, my own personal belief. And I don't believe we've time traveled. And I don't believe the stories that we're going to be hearing from Al Bielik tonight. But why I thought it'd be worth covering is, one, it was a rabbit hole that I dove down when I was younger. And I thought it was really, really interesting and fun and fascinating. And, and the way that you're going to hear him describe his story... Um, you know, uh, again, I don't believe any of it. I do not believe uh, that this was actually the case. My personal opinion is that he probably, you know, according to him, Al Bielik was an engineer and he remembered that he was actually Edward Cameron, a part of all of these experiments. So he claims that his consciousness, his soul, his, his identity was shifted to another body. All, but what I actually think the purpose of it all is it, it is a sort of government psyop. And so when he talks about his experiences in the future, he talks about the world's going to be run by AI, that the uh, it's going to be run by socialistic values, that um, all these things that I think the, 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 again, we're in the midst of the Great Reset, that the global elite already want us to believe and want us to move us towards. And so this whole thing frames that a man traveled and he's part of all these different uh, military experiments and time traveling. He wants us to believe that aliens are real, that they have advanced technology to travel through space and time, that uh, the AIs are going to win and that we're going to be ruled by them, that there's going to be socialist, you know, we're going to, that socialist values are going to dominate, that, um, what was it? One of the other things uh, that there's going to be massive climate change. Right. And so all of it to me then sounds like a government program. Yeah. Predictive programming as, as credible threat says, that's what I see it as. Now it's so funny though, if you were to ask me in my mid twenties, I was kind of interested in this stuff. And I want to then say that I think it's part of the lack of mysticism in the Western world that how I, I you know, just listening to some of his stories, I was thinking, um, how the heck did I believe any of this? And um, I thought, you know what? 
it's probably because of this the the the, the emphasis on psychedelics, uh, on mysticism, on radical experience. It's that you know, growing up in the West with Protestantism and secularism and rationalism, that we sort of uh, we've lost the mystical dimension of reality, and I think that's then being filled with magic and occultism, but also aliens, also these sort of people like the Al Belix of the world that, that sort of bring us into a worldview, a paradigm where, you know, there's so much more mystery, there's so much more magic, if you will, whether it be government technology, time travel, aliens, and that sort of keeps us uh, primed to those, to those paradigms, if you will. Um, and so... I think that it's in, you know, the, the fact that Al Bielik, and I'm even doing a stream on him, and one of the things I also thought, again, I have the channel that I can show you guys, um, uh, you know, where I get a lot of these videos that we're going to, because what we're going to do is we're going to listen to Art Bell on Coast to Coast, where he basically, then we can get the sort of whole Al Bielik spiel, because there's hours and hours and hours of this guy talking about how, He's part of these experiments and what they were doing at Montauk and, and the, you know, the multiple timelines because he claims that he still exists as Edward Cameron and that he, he, him and his brother Duncan Cameron were both, uh, you know, uh, well-to-do uh, seamen in the Navy and that they were these engineers that were then part of this ex the Philadelphia experiment and that they then get lost in the hyperspace when they sort of jump off the USS Philadelphia. Now... Why somebody like even Art Bell, I think people get wrapped up into it is because Al Bielik gives all these details to his story, you know, like, um, you know, and, and how he, he's going to be talking about people like John von Neumann, uh, you know, uh, Nikola Tesla. Well, we know who Tesla is. I, mean, I hope most of us know who Tesla is, at least. But John von Neumann is a very important person in history. So it's funny, this whole thing. Again, I do not believe this story. But I, I just want to use it as a case example of what I see as sort of predictive programming, uh, what I see as sort of these government psyops that get you because, he, I mean, how ironic is it that the government can use people like a, an Al Bielik to create these sort of fanciful worldviews that get then the people who are against the New World Order, who are against the Great Reset, to then believe in these stories that they say and then actually lead into a world that they're fighting against, right? And so they give you these false oppositional heroes to sort of look up to or look forward to, and uh, it's all just constructed. It's all fake, and it's all just taking you to your own imprisonment. And so that's what we're going to be doing um, is diving into uh, Al Bielik. Again, the Philadelphia experiment is sort of the main point of this whole discussion. So the Philadelphia experiment, they're going to claim, was actually a time-traveling experiment with the aid of Tesla and John von Neumann and all the sort of high-tech of the 1940s, if you will. Now, again, we're not going to believe any of this. But then it's going to tie Nazi, World War II, right? It gets all the sort of conspiratorial rabbit holes together and funneling together where it sort of ties these, again, into one big paradigm, if you will. That's why I think the, the Al Bielik thing is so interesting and, and sort of worth, uh, worth discussing a little bit. So the Philadelphia Experiment, they, they, he claims that he was Edward Cameron with his brother Duncan Cameron. They were, again, these seamen in the Navy that, that when the USS Philadelphia goes into hyperspace due to a sort of cloaking, a, an invisibility cloaking experiment by the Navy gone wrong, they jump overboard thinking, I got to get the heck off this ship. And when so doing, they actually fall into hyperspace and then go into like the, it was like the 28th century, uh, 25th century, this type of stuff he claims that he experienced. Um, so that is, um, that is like sort of the general frame of the, of the Philadelphia experiment. And then going along with this is this concept of the Montauk project in the Montauk base in New York, because he claims then that they were able to catch them out of hyperspace based on the U.S. government already active in time traveling, right? So because the time traveling, um, 
uh, is occurring that that basically they fall into hyperspace in 1942 and then they're caught in 1983 at, at the Montauk base where he claims that they, again this is the original men in black that there's extra you know worldly intelligences working with the federal government that there's these uh, very spectacular underground submarine bases tied to um, tied to uh, uh, Montauk, that there's these various like monsters that they've created, that there's mind control programs. He claimed at the Montauks that the, the CIA and the Fed and the, you know, these, these black operations within the government were actually hooking up homeless kids. They would steal kids. This is what Al Bielik argues here. They would take kids. They would then uh, put, they basically torture them, break their psyche, put electrodes on them to stimulate them, to put them in a perpetual state of orgasm so that they could be mind programmed and that then these, these mass shooters or these school shootings then uh, were all part of these kids that were basically being mind controlled by the government. Now, again, do I believe that he was part? No, I do not. But I believe that this is part of a proliferation of, you know, there's like little pieces of truth there, right? That they're sort of like mind controlled controlling your children and, and, and sort of corrupting them to perform maybe certain duties or activities in the world. I think that is true. Now, to the degree that Al Bielik talks about what they're doing in Montauk, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised to some degree. But he talks about how they would take homeless people, particularly homeless kids, if they could find kids under you know 18 that were homeless and they would take them and they would use them for some of these experiments. And... Um, and so that's kind of the stuff that they were doing at this Montauk base in New York is these mind control, dealing with aliens and whatnot. Now, um, then he also talks about how he had to switch bodies. So he grew up as Al Bielik, but really he's Edward Cameron. And, and then we're, we'll, you'll hear him sort of discuss this with Art Bell. Um, and so I think, again, it's so interesting that the future he describes is run by a single artificial intelligence that it basically controls the entire world. There's a one world government run by AI and that the whole world is basically run by sort of socialist values, that the, the United States has basically fallen apart. And that's what you saw. I saw somebody asking, like, what were the images were for uh, the thumbnail? And those images are the, sort of those decrepit cities and the falling apart of buildings. That is his description of what's going to happen to the United States in the future. And again, and he starts talking about all this climate catastrophe and climate change and stuff like that. So. So um, we're going to listen to this. Have a fun little Friday night. So if you guys have some whiskey, if you have some beers, you have something to drink, grab it. You know, I may go grab uh, a little, uh, you know, a couple fingers of whiskey and we're just going to have fun. We're going to listen to an old Art Bell uh, audio again of Al Bielik, of him, Al Bielik, talking about uh, these things. And so this is uh, just a fun, relaxed, enjoyable Friday night stream. I want to tell everybody, please smash that like who's here. Um, I want to make a few quick announcements for everybody. And the first one is that, uh, as you guys know, Jay Dyer is doing his next meetup in Orlando on September 3rd. September 3rd. And so um, <clears throat> what... Uh, what I am going to be doing, I mentioned that I wanted to kind of meet up with people in Florida at some point and meet, you know, basically just meet on the beach. That way it's not like I have to pay for a space or plan something out or have some major event we all pay tickets for. Basically, I was just going to say what beach I'm going to be on, when I'm going to be there, and then for if anybody who can show up to show up. And so... Uh, that has now sort of come to a bit of a resolution. And I want to say that for through Labor Day weekend, so <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, that is uh, September 3rd is a Saturday, for, to my understanding. Uh, okay, let's look. That is the day. Yeah, Dyer does his thing Saturday. So I plan on being in Florida probably through the 1st of September to, uh, you know, Tuesday the 6th. So, so at least from the 1st to the 6th, and we're going to be in St. Augustine, Florida, St. Augustine, Florida. So again, uh, I, I believe um, 
you know, I'm not sure where Jay and Jamie are going to be. I believe they also may be staying in St. Augustine. So I plan on meeting up on the beach, going to the gym, uh, just hanging out, enjoying myself, having drinks. If that's something, if you guys need to take a break and you're able, Labor Day weekend, make it over to St. Augustine, Florida. St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, get your own hotel. Get your, um, you know, get whatever you need, to, your room. If you live close, maybe you can drive over. And I was thinking about I'm going to create a Telegram group basically for the meetup. And so that that week, basically, again, we can go out to dinner, hang out. It's just I'm going to have my own little vacation, going to Florida, St. Augustine, spend time with Jay and Jamie, go to Jay's event over in Orlando on that Saturday on September 3rd. So if you guys plan on getting tickets, going to... Um, going to his event again hang out in st augustine you if you want to stay part-time in orlando part-time in st augustine basically st augustine is going to be where we're going to be at so if you want to hang out uh you want to go to dinner you want to catch some drinks i'm going to be in st augustine basically for a week and then um if you guys are there, then you, it's only a, an hour and a half, to my understanding, to get to the venue from uh, St. Augustine. So I'm, I just plan on driving. I'm going to drive down from Indiana and just stay there for a week, meet people, hang out, and then um, and then drive back home. So if that's something you guys sound interested in, you know, I definitely recommend coming. It's going to be a fun, fun time. And so that was number one announcement is that um, St. Augustine, Florida, Labor Day weekend, that's the place to be. It's going to be an ortho meetup. It's going to be great weather. It's going to be beach. It's going to be pina coladas. It's going to be a Jay Dyer event in Orlando. It's going to be great food, eating good. So, uh, so if that sounds like something you guys would like, you know, make your plans now. Set your stuff up, um, and uh, and I look forward to meeting everybody. So I'll I'll keep reminding you guys. Maybe I'll entice some of you just by repeating myself the next few streams that. Uh, we're going to be meeting up and, and staying in St. Augustine. So, if that again, if that sounds like something you want to do, uh, I recommend doing it. Maybe Jay and Jamie will make an appearance on the beach. So, you know, we'll have, uh, we'll have a, a bunch of, you know, ortho online content creators hanging out. And then whoever's there is there. We can hang out and have some drinks, catch some sun. So, next thing I want to say is, guys, please become a website member. If you appreciate what I'm doing here on Church of the Eternal Logos, one of the best ways to support is become a website member for $5 a month. I have exclusive video content where tomorrow you'll be seeing a video pop-up titled Rolling Stones Gather No Moss, where I'll be talking about the phrase Rolling Stones Gather No Moss and how this is tied to then what I believe, a process of rootedlessness, and that moss represents life. And a, a stone that's constantly rolling and constantly in motion actually acquires no life, and that rolling stone then whether it be the bu the band or the magazine is indicative of our culture and trying to get all of us just like papa was a rolling stone he wasn't responsible for his family so i'm going to be talking a little bit about the framework the the wording of rolling stones gather no moss and then again and typical codal fashion then extrapolating into something much larger like that guys smash that like everybody's here smash that like please so that's going to be at the video library. Also, we meet up twice a month for members. If you'd like to become a premium member, you can do so as well. Also, if anybody wants to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one session, we got one-on-ones uh, available for this coming Thursday, this coming Thursday. And of course, don't forget, if you guys have a great burning topic you want me to do a stream on, sponsor a stream. You know, sponsor a stream. Shout out to Jacob for the last one. Seemed like a lot of people really appreciated the Hebrew roots. Again, I was unaware how popular the Hebrew roots stuff was. So I really am glad everybody appreciated it. I was surprised how many people had relationships with it. Also, guys, um, yeah, so if you want to sponsor a stream, sponsor a stream. Nobody, I have no sponsors right now, so no streams are in the works. So uh, if you got one, send it. Also, I want to say I'm going to start doing some seminars. So coming soon, I'm going to start doing seminars for like uh, the first one's going to be on Logos Theology. So talking about the philosoph the Greek philosophical history, the development of the concept of Logos and how that ties into Eastern Orthodox theology. I'm going to do an hour and a half presentation and then... Uh, 
there'll be an hour and a half for Q and A, free free flowing Q and A, and so it's going to be a three hour plus Zoom meeting. These are going to be, uh, I believe, thirty dollar seminars where people who are interested in these topics they can purchase, and we're going to get into private Zoom groups and dive deep into these topics with PowerPoints, and I'll, I'll again prepare an academic hour and a half presentation. So. Uh, looking forward to those also beginning here soon and the fitness content will be emerging again. So, okay, now we've got all the announcements taken care of. Let's start to get into today's topic. So, uh, let's see, what's the first thing I wanted to show you guys? Let's see. Let's just do a quick, 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 quick overview of, um, of Al Bielik. So Al Bielik, here we go. All right. Al Bielik. We're not going to talk too much. We're not going to read the whole article. I'm just going to move through very quickly. So to introduce, again, the guy and the topic for today. So according to the popular legend, in 1943, the U.S. Navy undertook secret experiments based out of the port of Philadelphia. These experiments were designed to put Einstein's unified field theory to practical use by making a naval ship invisible. While conspiracy theorists debate the existence of the Philadelphia experiment, one alleged survivor of the scientific outing, Al Bielik, maintained that the Navy's purpose was entirely different. According to Bielik, the true purpose of the Philadelphia experiment wasn't in invisibility, but it was to time travel. In 1990, Bielik claimed that he spent time in two separate periods of the future, only to return to the present to tell his story. And that was just the beginning of the fantastic revelations of this totally, uh, completely, absolutely, 100% not fake time traveler. As if someone would make that up anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, it, it is fake. There's no way this happened. I do not believe this happened one bit. But it's funny how, again, like, again, Theoria Zone got into it. Somebody else mentioned they were into Al Bielik. Uh, you know, again, he died in 2011. So I found out about it like in 2010, right before he died. Um, I, cause I heard about the whole hubbub that they were trying to make all these tapes and he was doing all these interviews to, to leave all his, you know, the information before he passed away. And I, I remember watching all of it. Um, okay. So number one, he says he's a peculiar child. This is the first claim by Al Bielik. He was a peculiar child. By his own words, Al Bielik was born in 1927 to an otherwise wholesome family. He says his first memory came at a Christmas party when he was just nine months old. Because we all remember when we're nine months old, right? Of course. He found he was able to fully understand the adults talking in the room around him. Growing up, he says he is known as a quote-unquote walking encyclopedia, easily distinguishing himself among his classmates. Okay, number two. So Al Bielik claims he's, he's mentally gifted. Um, and he's been like that since he was a child in the Navy. You can time travel through space, through time and space as a young man, duty called. So Al was compelled to join the Navy to fight the Nazis. It was here that Bielik took his first trip through time. According to Bielik, he was just a lowly Naval officer serving aboard the USS Eldridge. And, and then again, this is after the, uh, the Philadelphia experiment. He claims he jumped overboard and so the jump to 2137, Al Bielik claims again he jumped off the Philadelphia experiment one day on August 13, 1943, to be exact. Bielik and his brother, Duncan Cameron, were subject to some odd happenings aboard the ship. They jumped to safely only to land in the year 2037. Life in a futuristic hospital. Al Bielik claims that while in 2137, Bielik was treated for radiation injuries through a highly advanced series of treatments that relied on the vibration of light. Uh, what's more, the entertainment in the hospital was solely educational and news programming, the only choice of TV in the entire world. Uh, okay. The Earth had undergone rapid change. This is where, again, his story, it, it starts to get into the predictive programming uh, because this whole thing, again, if you were to believe any of it, you're going to believe in basically the paradigm that the, trans the transhumanist, the Great Reset is offering us, which is... Uh, again, the machines, the advanced technology, um, how, you know, the government's so far ahead that they're doing everything for our good. Uh, they're protecting us from aliens. Um, you know, the AI is going to rule us. So again, a lot, lot of the stuff. 
So the Earth had undergone rapid change. When Al Bielik landed in 2137, he discovered that the geographical shifts had transformed the globe, he said. The coastlines of every continent had changed dramatically. Florida had disappeared except from the panhandle. Easily the worst part. The Great Lakes were just one great lake. Atlanta was three miles from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh huh. The United States was a relic. You know, one of the things I thought about too, as we listened to Al Bielik, I thought about. I wouldn't be surprised. Again, the whole backstory of him being an engineer and all this stuff was totally fake. And what it really was is that he probably was like an old CIA member, and that this was just a total psyop from the get go. And so that's why Al Bielik, he doesn't claim to have been part of the Philadelphia Experiment, all this stuff, until later in his life when he watches the movie, The Philadelphia Experiment. He claims the Phil watching the Philadelphia Experiment movie me triggered a sort of flashback, a mental flashback that broke down the the mental erasing programs that, again, at Montauk, Men in Black claims that they were there, that they could really re erase your mind and that type of stuff. That's what he claimed. So um, it wasn't until he was in his 60s, until much later, that when he watched the Philadelphia Experiment movie, claimed that then he realized that he you know had all these flashbacks broke the programming realized who he was how he connected all this stuff again so it's very believable in my opinion that he could have just been a cia agent and then they just came up with this whole framework and gave him the dates it's a script it's a script it's a, it's a it's a narrative it's a story to get people moving in a sort of general direction it's like a, it's a narrative vortex if you will Okay, so the United States was a relic. In 2137, Bielik said that the United States infrastructure had become completely destroyed. The central government was a total thing of the past. Both Canada and the U.S. were gone, ruled over with a kind of locally enforced martial law. And, <laughs> and that's where they, you know, we're, we're certainly moving in that direction, but again, I don't believe all this stuff. But just for fun, this is just a fun Friday night stream. This is just a fun Friday night stream. The world population diminished. Oh, that was another thing. He talked about how, oh, yeah, the, the, the population, global population dramatically declines in the future. Yep. And so according to Bielik, around 2005, the United States and Europe had banned together to fight off the combined threat of China and Russia. The resulting war killed billions of people. The total population of the world would only be 300 million. 300 million? That's smaller than the, uh, the uh Crap, what were the things that the uh, Georgia Guidestones? That's smaller than the Georgia Guidestones. An unannounced journey forward. From there, Bielik says that he went forward to the year 2749. There he stayed for two years before being transported back to 2137 to be picked up by his brother. In 2749, the world had adapted the technology to build mobile floating cities. Government of any kind was non-existent. Everything was run by an AI called the Synthetic Intelligence Computer System that worked telepathically. Oh, yeah. So tele we, we had telepathic, we're going to have telepathic communication with a machine, with an AI. That doesn't sound like what the elite would want us to believe and hope for and think about. Wars were non-existent in 2749. Sorry, Trump. Oh, my gosh. Like, that, this is where you, you know, it's just you look back at some of the stuff you believed in. You're like, how, how dumb was I? Is, is this Scientology? Basically, basically, it is Scientology. Felix stated that there were no wars in 2749 because, according to him, wars were practically impossible. There were no military or soldiers, Navy or Air Force. Okay. Everything was run on socialist values. Bielik reported that no one needed money in 2749. There was no need for it. Everyone had their own quote unquote credits. Maybe their social credits, which would allow them to quote buy everything they wanted uh, at any time. Exactly. Yeah. You don't get money. You get social credits. That's what we're moving towards. Exactly. Okay. Meeting, uh, this is Dr. John von Neumann. So von Neumann is a real guy, and he's actually a legitimate big deal. So if, for those of you who don't know, John von, uh, was it uh, Neumann? Um, big deal. He's actually a big deal, like especially with the development of computers. So you can look, look. Von Neumann made major contributions to many fields, including uh, mathematics, measure theory, functional analysis, uh, er ergodic theory, group theory, lattice theory, physics, numerical, uh, e economics, general equi equilibrium theory, computing, again, the von Neumann architecture, linear programming, numerical me uh, meteorology, scientific computing. So John von Neumann was 
a really, really, really smart guy. And you're going to hear Bielik refer to, to von Neumann like he was like they were friends and that, uh, again, von Neumann was under, under wraps working on all these sort of secret projects for the government. And he was also a professor at Harvard and he was doing his own stuff, according to Al Bielik. So um, you're going to hear him. But if you, didn't, if you weren't aware of John von Neumann, he's actually a guy worth looking into and becoming aware of. This is an important guy of the 20th century, one that I would say is often sadly overlooked. Um, very, very important guy. Worked on the Manhattan Project, right? So he definitely was doing some stuff with the federal government. Uh, so, um, yeah. So if you're not aware, definitely learn, just read a little bit about John von Neumann. You, you should, it's, it's very important stuff. So anyways, moving on. Uh, so Bielik is sent back from 2749 to 2137 to be picked up from, uh, to be, to build, to pick up his buddy. From there, the duo were transported to 1984, where they meet Dr. John von Neumann. So that's where he claims that Dr. John von Neumann, this real historical guy of great rapport uh, and, and success, that he's the one that was experimenting with time at Montauk in the 1980s, and that's how he caught them out of, out of the hyperspace, because technically they went in hyperspace in 1940, right? So this is, again, part of this narrative. Um which convinces the two men to travel back to the original time in 1943, just in case you were lost. <laughs> yeah, uh, Learning the real truth after this time, again, Bielik, uh, whatever, right? They revealed the U.S. military was actively involved in adapting alien technology. Oh, and, and forwarding research on psychic operations soon after Bielik was recruited by the Montauk Project. Uh -huh. Keeping undercover in California, though Bielik was working a job in California his importance to the Monchok project was so great that he was given access to the super secret network of high speed trains running under the country. This allowed him to work his normal job during business hours and then moonlight in Montauk for the government. Of course, once quote unquote, the time tunnel was perfected, he could just teleport back and forth. <laughs> More journeys and time traveling through the 1970s. Bielik was the program director for the physics who worked in Montauk. Claims he went to Mars, going public, uh, ruined the whole thing. Once Bielik went public with the extraordinary adventures, the government sadly disavowed him. They didn't even do him the dignity of calling him a crazy cook. They simply let him lecture, talk, because, well, he was crazy old cook. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so that's him. And, and we're going we're gonna to listen to a little bit of this on uh, Art Bell. So let me just share this link so we can just start to dive into these audios. Okay, so here we go. Let's just dive into it. And I'm going to go get a whiskey real quick. So guys, gals, we're going to enjoy. We're going to kick back. We're going to enjoy some Al Bielik here over on uh, Coast to Coast Radio. When's the last time you guys listened to Art Bell? So we're going to listen to some Coast to Coast. Uh, we're going to listen to uh, them talk about Al Bielik. So guys, Get your whiskey, get your beer, get your wine, get your, you know, your spritzer, get your seltzer, uh, whatever it is that you're into. And we're going to enjoy uh, listening to some of this nonsense tonight and enjoy our Friday night. John Neumann himself was a uh, premier mathematician. Okay, so I'm going to speed it up. I was listening to a lot of this stuff at one and a half. It may be too fast for everybody. I'm not sure. Um so uh, let me go to 1.25 just to make sure. But I'm going to skip around. We can't listen to this whole thing. It's two two and a half hours long. I've already skipped the first 15 minutes or so because he's basically just talking about his current life and living in Atlanta and all this stuff. But if you guys want to watch this whole thing, here, here's his appearance on the Art Bell Coast to Coast. I'll share this link here in the live chat. Um, and so you guys can watch the whole thing if you want. Um but um, we can just hang out and listen to some of this goofball nonsense. Um, so here we go. Guys, smash that like, too. Anybody who's here, smash that like. Let's turn this baby up. Let's find a good spot. And I got to pour me a couple fingers here. In many respects, I think he was ahead of Einstein because he could build hardware. Einstein 
So he's talking about John von Neumann. So we'll start here. So we'll start with John von Neumann again. This is just 14 minutes into Al Bielik's appearance, explaining the Philadelphia experiment, explaining that he's actually Edward Cameron, explaining how he was put into a different body, explaining how he was at Montauk, New York, how he was part of these secret groups, these secret intelligence agencies, and these secret experimentations. So that is where we're going to start, right here at 1441. Here we go. They didn't want time travel. They wanted invisibility, which required... You might say a phasing out of the physical region of reality while it's still physically it was here. So then the object actually uh, did not leave this time. It no. just began the transition that would be time travel if you continued. Correct. That was the approach at that time. And the mathematics that supported it were very involved. It involved recent earlier work that had been done by many people. <clears throat> I won't go into the, old, the history of it, but one of the uh, principles that set up the math was a Dr. David Hubert from Germany who was famous for his uh, multiple space, multiple reality mathematics. And Dr. John von Neumann himself was a uh, premier mathematician. In many respects, I think he was ahead of Einstein because he could build hardware. Einstein didn't know a transistor from, or a tube from a screwdriver. He was an excellent theoretician, but he knew nothing of practical matters in terms of designing equipment. Yeah, not, not hands-on. Right. Uh, Neumann was hands-on, which was a rare thing for a mathematician. He had a Ph.D. in uh, math in, from 1926 uh, in Europe and came to the U.S. in 1930, taught at Princeton for three years as an adjunct professor in the uh, uh, graduate school, and then was invited to join the staff in 1933 along with the other three unnamed. And Einstein, just as a curiosity, also left Germany in 1930, but he did not go directly to the Institute, and he went actually to Caltech and taught there for a number of years, three years, and was in Pasadena, California. And it's a long story how he got out of Germany. He was smuggled out by friends. The National Socialist Party did not want him to leave. They considered him a national asset. But after three years in the West Coast, he was invited to join the Institute in 1933, and he did, and he was there till his death in 55. So you had some of the best minds in the world at that time working on the project. That is correct. And the Institute was renowned then for being a think tank. It is no longer. It is, uh, well, we'll go into what it does now. It's still there. It still exists. But it is not doing the same kind of work. It didn't need research projects at that time, privately funded. And the invisibility study was supported by Navy grants and research money, but it was a private research project and was not classified at that time. Hmm. Well, in 1936, they had their first hardware test. It was partly successful, uh, which enough indication that they were getting results to continue their research in that direction. And they continued with this until 1940 when they had a fully successful test at the Brooklyn Navy Yard with a small tender. Well, I assume before they tested on a, on a ship uh, that they were testing on smaller objects in, in, in a lab environment. Is that correct? That was correct. And they were starting to get results. They built an equipment sufficiently large to uh, attempt to make a ship a tender approximately 250 tons invisible. Wow. Uh, they put the critical equipment on board the deck of that ship, and they had other heavy equipment, which is on two other ships adjacent, one starboard, one port. No one was on board the test vehicle, and they ran the equipment that was on board that ship on long cables because they didn't really know for sure what would happen. All right, Al, again, I've got to ask you to pause, and, uh, and I'll reset you right after this break, all right? Uh all right, and with that, I'm going to move. I'm going to click forward to after this break, and I'm going to run and grab uh, a couple fingers of whiskey, and I'll be right back. So I'm going to play the audio. Everybody, grab your drinks. I'll be right back. Stand by. Uh, you're listening to Coast to Coast AM on the Republic in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Al. You're back on the air again. Yes. All right. Um, again, uh, taking you back a little bit, they were uh, before we get to the ships. They were um, experimenting on smaller objects. Can you give me any technical details? on how they were, uh, what, what process they were using, and how far they actually got in the lab. Well, I can't tell you much about how far they got in the lab, because it was not part of the project until 1940, actually January 1940, along with my brother, before the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard test. Now, uh, to give you a brief rundown of the technical aspects of this, one has to understand that, first of all, we are not living in a three-dimensional universe, or even a four-dimensional, it's five-dimensional. The very man who first technically explored this possibility was a man by the name of E.D. Ospensky, a Russian mathematician who wrote a book in 1931 entitled Tertium Organum, which in English is a new model of the universe. And he described in there the fact that we are in a five-dimensional universe structure. Fourth dimension, of course, has been well defined as time, but it took uh, Einstein with unified field theory and others examining this to understand that the fifth dimension is also time, but it is the next up vector, if you will, the next higher order, called T2 in mathematical notation, which is the vector which controls T1, or the flow rate of time as we measure with a clock. And T2 describes, speaking again mathematically, a helix, a corkscrew through time, if you will. The forward motion is the, the rate which we measure as time in the T1 mode, or at the clock, if you will. But by manipulating the corkscrew, the 
rate at which that second vector at right angles to the first one of time moves, you control the rate of flow of time. Well, I, I, Al, I, I've got to stop you because I understand, I think I can understand, the flow of time, or what you're calling T1, yes, or sir. what we see go by on the clock every day. Right. That I can understand, laid out like a long carpet running endlessly into our future. That I understand. The second T2 effect on T1, I don't yet understand. Okay, well, let me give you another analogy, a model. You've seen, I'm sure, these uh, kids' toys, the <coughs> long coiled spring, where you hold at one end and you can uh, jog at one end and you see this motion, this wave through the coil as it goes to the other end and bounces back. You're talking about a slinky. Yeah, yeah, it's sure. a coil. Well, if you take this thing and close it in a loop like a donut, which is what Einstein said, we are living in a closed universe, everything is in a circle, including time, then you have a little bit of an idea of what we were dealing with. It's like a sleazy, except what we were doing, or attempting to do, and eventually did succeed in doing, was to enter this thing at some point along the edge of what we call our reality and create an artificial field which would affect within that field only the flow rate of time by affecting T2, you affect T1, and you can then affect the position where that object, in this case a ship, was on the edge of the coil of time, as we call it. I'm speaking automatically, of course. All right, I think I've almost got this. Um, okay. Now, what they were doing was by very complex fields affecting the time flow rate, and if you start to move the object around the edge, it starts to go out of our reality into the next one. You have to also understand that there are multiple realities involved in our universe. And they're all interrelated, but they're interrelated by being phased out uh, of our reference, phased out in time by at least 90 degrees into another reality. All right. Uh, Al, would that be, again, staying with the analogy of the slinky, then, would that be, instead of traveling along the surface of the slinky and going around and around and around and around, it is though you're, uh, as though you're jumping from one, one, one link to the other link directly without traveling the entire path, is that? That is correct. All right. Now, that, and you can again look at that in terms of another analogy, quantum physics, which uh, in the modern analysis using quanta is not only a quanta of energy and quanta of matter, but a quanta of time, according to those, that theory. And it is in a discrete little jump, as it were, which fits quite well this sleazy model. What we were attempting to do, and did eventually do, was to take an object, create a field around it, and move it in relation to the reality which we normally exist in, move it part way out. And if you get far enough along that edge, the sleazy, so to speak, what happens is the electromagnetic energy called light and also radio waves, particularly the higher frequencies that we use for radar, no longer are reflected by the object. And if they pass straight through it or around it, you can do it either way. There is no energy reflected. The object is invisible because it requires a return of some kind of energy so that you know that the object is there. But not invisible necessarily at that point to the eye? Yes, invisible to the eye also. Oh, okay. So gone, gone. Gone, gone so far as you can see. And that was what they did in 1940 at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They made the object invisible to eye, to a camera, and also uh, at that time it would have been invisible to radar, but radar was not of any major uh, development yet in 1940, even though the Navy had been working on radar systems from 1938 and had some on board ship, experimental. By 1943, of course, radar was well developed. We had excellent radar. The Germans did, the Russians did, right, and so forth. All right. Um, again, uh, I, what I want to understand is technically how this is done. In other words, uh, okay. what, what actual... Okay, we're going to skip forward to more of him getting into his personal tale here. So let's skip forward. And classified, and I do not, at this point, recall what the math was. Because certain other things happened to me, which have got four antenna creating an RF field at 160 megahertz. And all of this somehow interacting. Was the, were the magnetic fields also in rotation, or were they constant? No, they were rotating also. One inside the other at a different rate of speed. Actually, one was twice as, uh, rotating at twice the speed of the other. But both rotating counterclockwise. Wow. All right, RF, you've got RF, you've got the magnetic element. Was there anything else, or was it just those two elements together? It was those two elements together. There was nothing else directly involved other than the fact, of course, the fields being generated had the lower half truncated by the seawater because seawater is the most excellent absorber of both RF energy and magnetic energy. Magnetic fields do not propagate well through seawater. Uh -huh. They do, but they're attenuated rather rapidly. Huh. Uh -huh. In any case, that was the basic... Idea. I'll not attempt to go into any mathematics on this. Do you know uh, offhand how much power was directed toward the magnetic fields? Uh, we know in the case of the RF it was 500 kilowatts per. It was about 150 kVA total. All right. So we look and uh, finished our uh, common school education, if you will. Father encouraged us. We saw him about once a year uh, to get a good education, and there's no lack of money, so we went. So he's talking about his life as Edward Cameron and his brother Duncan Cameron, how they grew up in a wealthy family, and they both went into the Navy together. 
These are the people who, these are who he really is, who in the end time traveled, according to him. I went initially to Princeton, and took a bachelor's degree there, and was in my master's. I met Dr. John Van Neumann, who was on campus, and he took considerable interest in me and suggested that, uh, well, if you're going to get a PhD, I'll encourage you most thoroughly, but I think you would do better to go to Harvard. It's a better school, and, and so forth. So I went to Harvard for my doctoral work. And Duncan, in the meantime, for whatever reason, went to the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland. We both hmm. took our PhDs in the summer of 1939. And, of course, Father congratulated us. He was long since out of the Navy. And he arranged for us to enlist in the Navy and follow on Father's footsteps. So in September 1939, we both enlisted in the Navy in Church Street, New York. Went through a special 90-day <clears throat> training school for officers because we were given uh, commissions of Lieutenant J.G. upon enlistment. And <clears throat> this 90-day wonder school... Uh, there are all kinds of names have been appended to these particular schools or yeah. special schools for those to go to special assignments. Yes. We didn't know where we were going to go or what was going to happen until after we had been completed. Uh, the work there had been completed. We were assigned to the Institute of Advanced Study in January 1940. What were you actually going to be in the Navy, uh, Al, or what did you think you were going to do in the Navy? How about that? We didn't really know. We only knew that we were taking on probably careers in the Navy. And since we both had uh, PhDs in physics, we assumed it would be some technical role which was, of course, a correct assumption. And little did we know of Father's involvement in the background. Uh, we've done a lot of research on this since. He hasn't died. Died in 1981. He was born in 1891. He was 90 when he passed on. Father, after he left the Navy in 1929, was in some manner somehow still involved with the military, with intelligence, with espionage, and many things. We have yet to uncover the whole history, but we know that he was involved in smuggling Nazi Jewish scientists, uh, ex Nazi or Jewish scientists, out from under the nose of the Germans in Germany from 1933 until 1942. We've been able to determine about nine were brought over through the auspices of the company store, if you will, and I don't mean a three letter company, but Arnold Constable, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> through the company store, a long story in itself. And they stayed in Long Island under cover. When the war was over, they all went to work in special projects at Brookhaven National Laboratories, which is another story that comes after the Philadelphia experiment. Well, I was involved in a lot of things. We had yet to track it all down. But he was knowledgeable as to what was coming up, and he arranged for us to join the Navy, and apparently for us to become assigned. 6-6. Six, six. Back now to a uh, Al Bielek, no doubt, with a cup of coffee in his hand. Good morning, Al. Good morning. Yes, I have a cup of coffee. Uh, well, good. I, I'm glad to know that uh, that you're okay. It's, what, after, a little after 4 o'clock in the morning in Atlanta. That's right. All right, well, thanks for joining us at this weird hour. That was really nice of you. All right, we're up to the point of actually telling what happened, I guess. So right. what did happen? Okay, with the test of the Brooklyn Navy Yard with a tender, and I might point out there was very important, no personnel were on board that ship during the test. It was fully successful. It became invisible. And uh, at that point, the Navy said we have a successful test. They took over the project, classified it, called it Project Rainbow. And, of course, all personnel connected with the project, including Duncan, my brother, and myself, had our clearances, which was no problem. And they had special offices in the Philadelphia Navy Yard for the classified project, so we shuttled back and forth. Did you witness, uh, were you a witness to the first one, Al? As I recall now, no. I was not a witness to that. Now, what happened at that point, of course, was went up and down the line, and uh, eventually President Roosevelt heard about it. He was elated, and he says to uh, Mr. Tesla, says, Nicola, says, I'm giving you now a real ship to make invisible. I'm loaning you a battleship. He says, if you can make that invisible, you can make anything invisible. All right, uh, uh, there's where I'm going to stop you, Al. I've got a couple things to do. Uh, rest for a moment. We'll be right back to you. All right. I believe that we are back again. Good morning, everybody. We're sorry for the interruption. We were for the test for the battleship, and they were nearly complete. The Tesla was having serious misgivings about the problems of the extreme power required to make a ship of 30,000 tons invisible as compared with a small tender. In which the He's talking about Nikolai Tesla. would be personnel present. He was very concerned about the possible damage or injury or even death of uh, personnel from the very high-powered electromagnetic fields. Now, um, as you would ask earlier, there is, at that time, there was no uh, information in the literature about what the neurological effects of certain levels of RF from magnetic fields would be. This was new territory. And, of course, today we have a lot of that information. as a long history of tests. But it stems from the Philadelphia experiment as the beginning point. Well, he was concerned. He was very severely concerned, and he went to the Navy and asked for an extension of time to solve the problem. He says, I'm sure I can solve it. I need more time. The Navy said, you have an assigned test date, March 42. Do what you have to do, but you must meet that date. He had a serious problem there, and he knew it, and he decided uh, the two options he had to go ahead with the test or to cancel it, that he would sabotage the test deliberately by detuning the equipment so that when the switches were thrown on that fateful day, nothing happened other than a few pieces of equipment blew up. 
the tubes blew out and the transmitters, and that was all. So he was in fear of what was about to happen uh, to the degree that he actually sabotaged the test. He did. And, uh, of course, he bowed out at that point and saying, the test is a failure, I have other things to do. You have a, we have a very good man here, you have a good man here who can take over these tests, Dr. John Van Neumann. Well, of course, there's argument to this day, did he leave voluntarily or did the Navy fire him? Regardless, he left. And, of course, as history shows, he didn't live much longer after that. He died on January 7, 1943, in his hotel room in New York, the New Yorker in New York City. John Van Neumann takes over, and, of course, we're saying, he says to the Navy as well, I have to study the problem and see what's wrong here. And it didn't take him long to find out what happened. But he decided that he was going to take it. Yeah, Prison makes a great point, and so did uh, Theoria Zone about the the matter of fact way that Al Bielik speaks about these stories and the details he gives and some of the sophistication. That's what makes me think that again. I don't. I don't. I per, my worldview. I just don't believe these stories. I don't think they're possible. Um, and so it it to me it's like it, it's more likely that it's a sort of thought out script that he was getting it sort of memorized. And that way he can add these details and these specific things and these references, the different projects and people and names and places and dates. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? You know, talk about it in the chat. Manage this opportunity to redesign the equipment. Tesla's approach was analog. And Van Norman was known as a man who liked pulsing equipment and the pulsed approach. So he decided to redesign the equipment for pulse modulation rather than a continuous analog uh, form of modulation. All right, I would think, uh, and maybe you can uh, help me out here, but I would think once you moved into the area of pulse, you would be able to uh, achieve higher uh, peak uh, power levels, and that was the idea. Very true, and that was his idea. He, of course, abandoned the battleship, and the battleship was resumed return to service. I don't recall now what happened to it, but it wasn't there after a certain day. And we were all part of it at that point. So Van Neumann, in the room about in June 42, decides he wants a ship which is designed from the ground up for this project. So in July, he went to the uh, shipbuilding, federal shipbuilding yards in Newark, New Jersey, picks a number off the drawing board, DE-173, which later was known as the Eldridge, and said, I want this, this, and this chain. Basically, what he wanted was of the four gun turrets, number two was to be left unfinished. They said, you have a dummy wooden turret for it, or test at sea, but they wanted that... B love, I actually have it sped up. I can slow it down here if you if he's talking too fast for you guys. It's because I have it sped up. It's just because the the interview's two and a half hours long. I don't have enough time. Uh, but here, I'll, I'll go normal speed so it's easier to understand. Cool as it were, left unfinished without the uh, ammo uh, racks below. Part of the interior of the ship was to be gutted so they could drop the heavy equipment in through that hole and slide it on rails to the central point midships. So the ship was built with those specifications. It came down the ways in September of 42, went into dry dock for outfitting the heavy equipment. The heavy equipment included the two 75 kVA generators, which were designed for this project, along with a very large electric motor with two right-angle gear drives. The electric motor was a 750-horse monster. Wow. The entire equipment was run on its own separate power system from ship's power. They ran a special diesel electric generator, about 8 megawatts output, which was a lot of output. That's a big generator. That's a big generator, but that's one of the reasons they had to have the interior of the hole gutted. All that equipment was moving in the dry dock, and then about September of 42, of course, the ship was taken under its own power. It was not totally gutted by any means, uh, to the Philadelphia Navy Yard and put in a secure area in the rear. It was a front section for ordinary shipping, and there was a rear section with access control by a drawbridge for classified projects. So in December, the ship was sent there, and then in January on, the special electronics equipment was moved on board. It wasn't that large. Also, during that summer, Van Norman decided, the Navy concurred, they wanted a special crew for these tests, namely an all-volunteer crew. So they went throughout the Navy, acquired after a period of time some 33 enlisted men, about seven officers who volunteered for this project, and essentially signed their lives away, and uh, went to a special training school in the Coast Guard Academy at Groton, Connecticut, if I remember correctly, for three months, from September to December of 1942. And who was the schoolmaster, if you will? We still have a picture of this crew. The headmaster was none other than my father in his Coast Guard uniform. Uh-huh. And there he was again, involved with the project. Well, it just intertwined uh, your father. So he's saying that his father, his brother, himself, were all involved in the Philadelphia experiment. He intertwined all the way through this, didn't he? That is correct. He intertwined a lot later. I'll go into that later. In any case, he was involved... We know this now. And this crew, when it was finished with its training, was assigned to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. The electronics went on board the Eldridge, as it came to be known later, uh, during that period in January to March. Now, we came back in there, as I said, the uh, beginning of 42, and we were in through that whole period. And uh, 
We then said to Van Norman repeatedly, you're very likely to have a problem. Tesla said so. He was not very pleased about the mentioning of the name Tesla. I have to point something out. All of the personnel at the Institute had PhDs, with the sole exception of Nikola Tesla, who was not on staff. He was there as a consultant, you might say. Were the two of them competitive, Al? In a certain sense, that was true. Mm -hmm. They both highly respected each other's abilities, and uh, von Neumann never doubted the capability of Tesla. He had an impeccable reputation up to the point of the test failure in March 42. Were there professional jealousies? It was all a professional jealousy, because Tesla, you see, did not have a degree. He had an honorary PhD, but he did not have a real one. I see. But no one questioned his capability. No one at all. Uh, but it was a sort of professional thing. He was a man head of the project who didn't have a PhD. <laughs> uh, so I can understand there might be some resentments there. All right, hold the story for a second. We'll be right back to you, Al. Okay. Uh, Al Bielik and the Philadelphia Experiment is the subject this morning. Stay right where you are. Back now to Atlanta, Georgia. And Al, we've got about three minutes before the break at the bottom of the hour. Go ahead. Okay. With the uh, continuing work on this, as we learned when we mentioned particularly about Tesla's name to von Neumann, he became very irate. But von Neumann himself became convinced in a short uh, period of time that there was a potential for problems on the human element. He decided to up the power. First of all, it was a pulsed approach, 10% duty cycle. Mm -hmm. And he decided to up the power. The transmitters, which are our transmitters, which had been half a megawatt output, he upped the boosters to two megawatts each. Holy mackerel. He, he uh, uh, quadrupled it. Pulse, theoretically, to 20 megawatts each peak pulse power output. It didn't go that high, but it had a theoretical capability. Wow. He made no change in the generator system other than with the pulse technique. He had to put special damper coils on the top of these conical magnetic field generators, if you will, on the deck of the ship, which stood a little over six feet high, by the way. And he started to become concerned about the problems of power and related to the human mind and the uh, neuro neurological system. So he decided to uh, try to do something to compensate for this. He added a third generator to the system. There. So what he's talking about is that Tesla was worried that the, that the particle accelerator that they're going to be using for this experiment for the invisibility cloaking that it was going to cause harm to the people now i'm going to i'm going to skip forward here and i'm going to kind of leave you guys some information he talks about how they did do a, a for initial experiment and it sort of briefly went invisible but it was surrounded by a sort of green fog a green smoke or something and then they did it again and it's this other time that they really went into sort of hyperspace if you will and he talks about how uh, that when the when they came back, when the sort of boat was the ship was in hyperspace, like people's DNA, their body parts were sort of fused into the metal because all the sort of particles re reconstitute itself, and that people were like stuck inside the walls of the ship and all this different stuff. So you're going that's what we're getting ready to get into, but it's just kind of slow. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit. what the procedure was, so we fired up the equipment, and the ship uh, became invisible to sight as well as to radar. By 43, they had very good radar. concerned about radar invisibility. Everything went very well. After about 20 minutes, the uh, commander who was in charge of the test, the Captain Harrison, who is now deceased, uh, ordered the test discontinued. Okay, look, I, I want to ask you a question about the test, Alan. Um, I, of course, was not there, and I just saw the movie, but I'm recalling that in the movie, the ship did not disappear right away. It kind of wavered and uh, quavered and uh, uh, shimmered almost. And is that the way it was in reality? Partially correct. However, in the first test, the ship disappeared from sight as well as from radar, but it was surrounded with a mist and it was a sort of greenish fog. And why the color green, we don't really know, except that one of the byproducts of this test was in generation of large amounts of ozone gas. Right. Uh, the ship, however, was still there in the harbor, but what they found in the process of the observation was that the water line which would show where the ship should be was much larger than the ship, and there was an apparent hole in the, in the bay, much larger than the ship itself, and they couldn't see the bottom of it through binoculars from the uh, observing uh, personnel on the carrier. A hole in the bay? Yeah. Uh, in other words, a very large water line with nothing there. Wow. And Captain Harrison was very concerned about this. He said that he knew the ship was gutted in the interior and there wasn't uh, everything there in the normal internal structure, and he was afraid that the ship might be supported on air rather than on water, and it would break in half. He knew that if that were the case. So we ordered the ship's test discontinued, we turned off the power, and we turned under a normal power back to dock site. At that point, we found out that those personnel who were on deck were very severely disoriented, nauseous, ill, as the saying goes out of it, and uh, 
definitely not well showing the effects of exposure to very high powered electromagnetic radiation. All right, these were the, the, the personnel on deck, but not necessarily those who were inside. Those that were... is correct. Those below deck were not affected. Duncan and I being behind steel were not affected. Steel is an excellent shield against both magnetic fields as right. well as RF. Right. Well, so where were you exactly when the test, uh, the first test occurred? We were in the control room, which was midships, and uh, we ran all the equipment right from that point. So you were actually operating the equipment that did this? That is correct. That was our job and our task, Duncan and myself. It took two people to operate the equipment properly. And we just continued the test on orders, went back to the Navy Yard. They found out they had very sick personnel. Then uh, Neumann was quite concerned about this. The Navy says, not to worry, we have another crew for you. And uh, Neumann then went to the Navy and says, I have to look at this and study this and uh, try to solve this problem. The Navy gave no response for a few days, and Von Neumann asked for an extension in time, uh, rather an indefinite one. The Navy finally came up with an answer and says, you will complete the test by the 12th of August, 1943, or forget it. It was a drop-dead test date. Like, do it by then and just forget the whole damn thing. Well, nobody understood this, and I knew how Bowen fairly well at that point, and I went to him and said, what is this all about? And he says, well, that's the orders I received. And he says, where did they come from, and what's this all about? And well, he tracked it down, found out that it came from the Chief of Naval Operations himself, who was then Admiral King, and he was told that this is the way it is. Now, Admiral King, as CNO, is not concerned other than the cursory way of engineering tests. He is concerned with the operation of the war and the Navy's part in that and all theaters of operation. He is not a man who is going to take detailed interest in an engineering test. So we didn't understand this. It took a long time to find out what was really involved. In fact, it took many decades. In any case, we had the 12th, uh, 12th of uh, August drop dead date, and the Navy says, oh, uh, you don't have to worry about invisibility for the eye, optical invisibility. All we're really concerned about is radar invisibility. Well, that made a slight decrease in the stringency of the requirements. And uh, on the 12th of August... Uh, Al, how much less power did it take uh, to produce radar invisibility versus real invisibility? It was not so much a matter of power as a matter of scientific approach and how much of a phase shift in terms of the uh, time vector I've was got required. You. I've got you. So in other words, the power levels were roughly consistent, just the phases were changed. Right. What we did was pay a shift phase around the coil, as I called it, of time uh, to a slightly lesser degree of shift, which would still provide radar invisibility. And what we did is you shift them to that point, and then you locked at that point. That well, was the theory. Were the biological effects uh, less with that shift? No, as we found out. On the 12th of August, we were about to proceed with the rest of the tests, and what uh, Captain Harrison insisted upon was to have hydrostatic tests of the hull stress by means of special sensors installed on the hull inside and outside. The submarine was assigned to go under the ship and see what was going on, and a secondary crew was put on board that ship for these tests. At the last minute, something went wrong. They decided to cancel the special hydrostatic test. The secondary crew was pulled off, put on the sub, and the sub pulled out, and we were left there along with Duncan and I standing by the rail. We were very perturbed, wondering what places is going on. We knew something was wrong, but we had no idea what. And the orders came to proceed with the test in the normal manner, so we did. Well, from the standpoint of those outside on the observer ships, and for the second test, there were three observer ships. There was a carrier, there was a naval a Coast Guard cutter, and there was a commercial ship known as the SS Furiaset, which figures very prominently in the book written by Perlitz and Moore, Project Invisibility. And uh, they were concerned because in 1943, the German submarine fleet was sinking 50% of our shipping crossing the ocean to get to England. Right. And the merchant marine ships wanted the equipment immediately if it was successful. So they were observing the test themselves. Fired up the equipment as on command, and for the first 60 or 70 seconds, everything seemed to be normal. The ship had radar invisibility, but you could still see it vaguely through a fog. And then there was a bright flash of blue light, and the ship disappeared completely. The waterline disappeared, and there was no ship there. Well, everybody panicked, particularly John the Neumann, and there was no radio contact, and there was no contact for some four hours, and the ship finally returned to the harbor in the same location. And we knew immediately something was wrong because the special radio antenna, which had been designed by T. Townsend Brown, as his contribution to the project because he was involved with special Navy projects. And I'm not going to go into the, his history on this. But his antenna was broken, pieces missing, and there was superficial structural damage, and they could get no radio response, and they could see something was wrong on deck for binoculars. So a special boarding party was sent out to board the ship, and they did, and they found four sailors in the process of dying. Two were buried in the steel deck, and two were buried in the bulkheads. Uh, standing upright, but immersed, if you will, in the steel. The fifth man had a hand buried in the steel, bulkhead. He lived, they cut his hand off and gave an artificial hand later. God, what a terrible way to die. Yes, definitely. And one of those in the uh, bulkhead upright happened to be a younger brother, Jim, who was six years younger than I, and he enlisted in the Navy after the war started, and he wound up in the volunteer crew, and he wound up throwing the straw for the second test. And he was dying. I put my arm around him, and Duncan 
looked at this and decided I will have to backtrack a little bit. He decided to jump overboard. Now, this is not the first time. Let's go back a little bit and tell what happened to Duncan and I. All right. That gave the uh, external observance of what happened. Now, internally, we were in the control room, and for about 30 seconds, everything seemed to be normal. But then we realized something was not right because the banks of electron tubes, there were some 3,000 6L6 tubes, not the miniatures, but the full-size bottles. My God, I remember the 6L6, uh, Al. That was in the first amateur radio transmitter. I had one of them. Yep, and Driven. we used a lot of those in the audio equipment for years and that, years. That's right. Driven by a 6AG7. Now, how's, how's that for a memory? Oh, very good. <laughs> well, yes, that's a good tube at that time. In any case, the banks started wavering. Then we started to get electrical arcing internally in the control room. Now, there was no high-voltage equipment in the control room, and yet we were having the equivalent of 100,000 volt plus arc overs. And it got worse, so we couldn't raise no one on the radio. It seemed to be working, but there was no response. We then had a transmitter linked directly to the transmitter, as well as a receiver in the control room, unlike the first test. We could raise nobody. It was, and we were on our own, and our instruction said, do whatever you feel is appropriate should something go wrong. So we went for the power switches, and the main power to shut everything down, and the handles were frozen. They wouldn't budge. So at that point, with everything getting worse in the control room, we decided to get out of the control room, went out on deck. There was no one buried in the steel at that point, but everyone was running around. It was a mist on deck, and you couldn't see anything beyond the rail. We both got the right idea at the same time, jump overboard and swim ashore. So we did jump overboard. I can understand that. But we never hit the water. We fell and fell and fell like we were falling through a tunnel for what subjectively seemed like about a minute. And then we found ourselves landing on dry ground at night in what was obviously a military base of some kind because it was a chain-link fence of a military design directly to our rear. Suddenly there was a bright light overhead, a searchlight beaming down, as we found out later from a helicopter, but in 43, who knew much about helicopters? They were sure. experimental sure. at that point. And suddenly out of nowhere comes a number of MPs. They grab us, and they take us to a building on this base. We go inside, and we go in an elevator. We go down several levels, and the door opens. And we see a lot of military personnel running around, and then an elderly civilian with white hair approaches us. The gentleman, I've been waiting for you. I'm Dr. John von Neumann. At which point we look at him and says, you're who? And he says, I'm Dr. John von Neumann. John von Neumann. I said, it couldn't be. We left him perhaps an hour ago. He's a much younger man. I said, yes, I know. He says, I'm the same man you knew in 1943. This is not 1943. Or this is now the year 1983. You're at Montauk, Long Island, part of the Phoenix Project, or as we call it now, the Montauk Project. Well, we couldn't believe him. We thought he was bonkers. Of course. But nevertheless, he gave us a cook's tour of the underground, and we see computers, graphic displays, large screen color TV, and things which did not exist in 1943. So he was expecting you. He was definitely expecting us. So we stayed there about 12 hours, and after watching TV for several hours and seeing ads for flight of Hawaii on a 747 jet, we sit there with our mouths of deep and uh, look at some shots of the freeway traffic and freeways and man on the moon and references and the Cold War, we suddenly realized something was terribly wrong, or maybe the man is right. We were there about 12 hours, and von Neumann sprung it on us and told us what had happened. He said, this project in 1983, the Phoenix Project, has locked up through time with the experiment with the Eldridge in 43. And he said, the ship disappeared and is in hyperspace. We can't control that ship from here, but the generators have to be shut off. He says, we have created a bubble in hyperspace which is growing, and we don't know how big it will grow or what will happen if it isn't stopped. All right, that, that, there's where I'm going to stop you, Al. I've got a couple things to do. Uh, rest for a moment. We'll be right back to you. Okay. And uh, there is Al Bielik in the future in 1983, and that's exactly where we'll pick it up in a moment. Smash that like, guys, and I'll be hitting the Super Chats here in probably about 30 minutes. We're just going to keep on rocking and rolling and listen to some of this stuff. Hope you guys are enjoying. Cheers to everybody. Grab your drink. Let's get back to some wild conspiracy theories of Al Bielik. Al, you're back again. Okay. Well, we spent about 12 hours there at Montauk, and Von Neumann Springs just went on us about the ship being in a hyperspace bubble. The power was fed to keep that bubble going and growing from the ship itself. It says, we cannot control the equipment on the Eldridge from here. We have to send you back to shut off the equipment. As we had told him, we couldn't. He said, you'll have to shut it off any way you can, smash it, destroy it, whatever. So we looked at him and said, no, just how are we going to get back there? He says, that is no problem for us. He says, here in this project, we have solved the problems of space and time. We can send you anywhere we want at any time we want. And we will send you back to the decks of the Eldridge. And it's up to you from that point on. Huh. Well, I'll make a long story short. He did send us back. He couldn't send us back, and we took up axes and smashed the equipment. When enough was smashed, of course, the generator started to wind down, and we knew it was over. So we went out on deck. At that point, having accomplished our task, and that's when we saw the sailors buried in the steel. It was still a haze, and it took about two minutes, approximately, for the fields to collapse. Uh, the ship did return to the harbor at the same point. Before it did, however, the episode I referred to earlier, Duncan looking at me and 
like, aren't I going to go with him? He jumped overboard and he disappeared. As we found out much later, he returned to that project in time in late 82 or early 83. We don't know exactly when. Eventually, he died there. Al, he, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. What do you think would have occurred, or what's the best guess about what have, would have occurred had you not been able to get back on board and smash that equipment? A Neumann's assumption at that time was that the hyperspace bubble would grow to the point where it could overwhelm the Earth itself. And uh, they were concerned, theoretically, of course, whether it was a practicality or not. And there's enough fuel in the generator supply to keep those equipment running for 30 days if they didn't break down first. And it could theoretically engulf the Earth. The Earth itself, theoretically, could disappear in a hyperspace bubble. Hmm. In any case, that was a theoretical concern, and they weren't about to we'll sit around and wait for it to happen. So we did smash the equipment. The ship returned to the harbor. Duncan jumped overboard. I remained with the ship. The four sailors died, and, of course, the boarding party uh, reported what had happened. They sent another party on board ship to bring it back to the, uh, <clears throat> out of the harbor, back to the rear part of the Navy Yard, because there was no other damage to the ship. Now, uh, how many personnel total were there on the ship? At that time, there was approximately 21, as I remember the numbers. 21. There was a normal complement of 150 officers and men, but there was a skeleton crew for just the test. Do you know for the inquiry? Do you know Do you know how many of those are still alive today? Very few. Uh, I know of about four enlisted men and one officer, other than Duncan and myself, who are still around. It's possible there are others, but I'm not sure of that. How uh, many? How many actually died? Both directly. Uh, at that time, there were four who died. There were two others who jumped overboard, besides Duncan and myself, and they uh, disintegrated immediately. It raises a good issue: Why did we survive and the others didn't? And uh, others who disappeared, and uh, some of those on the surface of the ship, one in the funny farm, because they were totally insane. How, how do you know that they disappeared or disintegrated, rather? Uh, why the, the, stories, the stories were they were seen to disappear, and, of course, there was a shortage of the complement. When they made it a nose count, so to speak, later, there were several missing. I understand that, but why wouldn't you presume the possibility that they, too, moved into a different time and just did not get back? Unknown. That's an unknown. We can assume anything you want. So it's definitely possible. Uh, one, definitely. Yeah, the reason I say that is because that's what occurred to you, so one could reasonably presume that that occurred to them. They simply may not have gone to the same controlled experiment with a return that you did, so they may have lived out their lives in some other time. That is very possible. It is definitely an unknown, but it's almost anything to be assumed possible. In any case, we had a four-day board of inquiry. What went wrong? I gave my report, which included the trip to the future. Nobody believed me, including Dr. Von Neumann. And uh, after all of this, the Navy said, well, let's try one more test. We have a lot of spares and equipment. Rip out the damaged equipment and uh, have the ship ready for another test. And this was done in the harbor, the outer harbor of Philadelphia in October of 43. And they decided to do the 1940 routine, put the ship on station and remove all personnel and control the equipment by remote cable. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. all right. Hold that. Uh, hold it right there. We're at the top of the hour. You've got five minutes to rest, and we'll come back and get uh, the final experiment. Okay. All right. Um, what a story, huh? This is Al Bielik you're listening to. He's with us from Atlanta, Georgia. Al Bielik was part of the Philadelphia experiment. And, yes, we will open the telephone lines. So get ready for more. 28-8255. Story. It's been underway now for two hours, but just before we get to that, I've already got a fax question here for you. Here, I'll read it to you just the way I got it. It's from Devin Rambo in Bakersfield. He says, a question, are there any books I can go get about this? This is the weirdest, coolest science fiction or non-science fiction story I've ever heard, and I'd like to read about it. So what about it? Uh, where would he buy a book that would tell him about this? Well, the history of uh, literature on the subject goes back quite a ways, but in terms of actual books, there was one entitled Thin Air, published in uh, 1978, which I believe is out of print, and told in a fictionalized form, the story of the Philadelphia Experiment. The one done by 1979 by Berlitz and Moore, entitled The Philadelphia Experiment, Project Invisibility, is well known and has been available as a paperback for many years. It's still available. But it does not really tell the detailed history of what exactly happened. Mr. Moore, who did most of the research, was never able to find out very much, and he has done 180 since and says he doesn't think it ever happened. The other one was the one written by uh, myself and Brad Steiger, entitled The Philadelphia Experiment and Other UFO Conspiracies. It is available in many of the New Age bookstores, and if the listeners are not able to find it that way, uh, they can contact me and ship it out. I have it available. Who is the uh, publisher? Publisher is Inner Light Publications, New Brunswick, New Jersey. All right, and, and how, would they con how would they contact you, Al? They would have to contact me through my post office box here in the Atlanta area. It's actually in Marietta. And I'll have to get that number out. And all right, Darren, why don't you do that during one of the next breaks? Uh, do. All right, now uh, here we come. The final uh, experiment you were going to tell us about. Right. So in uh, late October, late at night, they decided 
It was set to put the ship on station, pull all the personnel off, and uh, control the equipment by remote control through over a thousand feet of cable. And again, the ship disappeared, came back some 15 or 20 minutes later, and the equipment related to the invisibility test was a smoking ruin. So at which point the Navy washed their hands of everything connected with these tests and says re-equip the ship for war duty. And uh, it was so re-equipped, and from approximately January of 1944 on, it was in the uh, normal operations of the war. It was retired in 1946, put into mothballs. 1951, President Truman uh, took the Eldridge and others out of mothballs on a agreement with the Greek Navy and was transferred to the Greeks. They renamed it the Leon. And as we found out with research and correspondence, the Leon is still in the Greek Navy to this day. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that was the saga of the Eldridge. Insofar as I am concerned, I remained in the Navy as a career officer and for a number of years. But Neumann took me aside and says, I don't know whether to believe your story or not, and it's not very much of a problem. I'm going to build a little time machine here, and I'm going to send you back in the future, and you're going to bring proof back to me of what has happened, uh, that your story is true. Now, unbeknownst to the Navy, because he worked at that time with the Institute, and the Navy was not directly funding the Institute and had no control over it. I'm sorry, this was in 1951? No, this was in 1940, late 43, early 44. And, and at that point, he was, going to, uh, he was going to build a time machine? Yes, and he did. And he did? Yes. And he sent me back uh, to the project in the 80s, 82, 83, and more than once. I brought back eventually proof of the fact that I had been there and that he had been there, or was to be there in terms of 1943. Wow. And he eventually was satisfied. And he then went on to other projects. And in October of 43, he became involved with the Los Alamos bomb project. And in the summer of 44, in July of 44, at his request in the Navy's uh, very uh, happy uh, agreement, I was shipped with family because by that time I was married and had a uh, baby son. And I was up to Los Alamos and helped work on the project along with Von Neumann, who was actually not resident there but a consultant and a visitor. Remained at Los Alamos until July 4, 1947 which time I was arrested, charged with espionage, which was absolutely ridiculous, but nonetheless I was arrested. You were charged with espionage? Yes. I was removed from the family, whom I never saw again, either the baby son or my wife. And this was a Cameron, understand, not as I'll be. Uh-huh. And I was taken uh, by train to Washington, D.C., expected a full court-martial. There was none. Charges were canceled. They said, we have a new assignment for you. We're sending you out to Port Hero, Long Island. There is a Navy base out there. And I said, okay. I did not know at that point that Fort Hero, an Army base containing also a Navy base, was the exact location of the Montauk Project, the Phoenix Project as we called it, where in later years it became the main project, which in 1983 pulled us from the Eldridge. So I was sent out there in uh, 1947, and I was there a few hours and was told to go to a certain circle, stand there surrounded by a large number of military personnel with drawn weapons that don't move. I didn't tell me I was not there. I was back in the underground area of Montauk, and a very von Neumann says, I don't like what they're going to do to you, but I have nothing to say about this. I'm only a consultant here. Hmm. And they're going to strip you of your memories, and they're going to send you back into the past, and you're going to start life over as somebody else. So they did, to make a long story short, strip me of all my memories, and by means of age regression techniques, which the government has, they can physically regress the age of a person, anyone they so choose, to make them much older person, much younger, like a 65-year-old person to be made equivalent to 25 physically without losing any of their memory or capabilities. Very closely guarded secret. I know people have gone through it personally. Uh, and Al, I've, I've got to, I want to stop you for just a second because I want to ask you a question. Sure. What, what do you say to people? Uh, I mean, you sound, you sound lucid to me, Al, but there are people who will listen to this story and they will say, uh, you were really a candidate for the Philadelphia loony bin. <laughs> and uh, what do you say to these people? Well, I can say is do your own research. If you don't believe me, that's your choice. I mean, I can't uh, force anyone to believe the story. I know it's uh, certain aspects of it are very difficult to accept, but there are people who know of these uh, aspects of the experiment, namely the age regression research that was done from 1947 approximately on with at a research institute in Miami, Florida, which Howard Hughes himself bought. Age age regression? You mean uh, age, psychological? Age research which led to age regression. You mean psychological regression? No, they were doing physical age regression. They were concerned physical. with the physical aging of the body and how to stop the aging process and, if possible, reverse it. Wow. After several decades, they came up with some workable systems and finally were able to do a full age regression, taking a person back up to 40 years, 40 years off of their age physically, make them young again. And they held us special people in the government. They didn't want to leave service because it was much too valuable. And uh, that's a long story in itself. What about Einstein? Surely they would have uh, taken him back. The equipment was not functional at that time. He died in 1955, and the research had not, was not completed to a workable state until the late 60s or early 70s. Good point. Good point. Okay. 
Okay, they decided to do one better with me. They were going to take me back and they shrink me down to a young kid of age of about one after stripping me of all memories and then plugged me in another family, and that's how I became a Bielik. I was transported backward through time because not thought they could send you any place they wanted. Somehow they prepared it. How, I don't know. All right, if they stripped you of your memories, Al, how yes. do you know everything that you've told us? Because no matter what techniques are used to remove memory, other than brain surgery itself, they had to keep me alive for various reasons. I'll go into that later. And they had to keep Duncan alive for various reasons. He was given a new body and uh, was sent back into a period, 1963, when he assumed the new body, which was already 12 years old. Huh. Got verification of that out of a CIA agent who knew the whole story. He was following Duncan around for 20 years. Uh, the story, I know, becomes very difficult to believe. And nevertheless, things go on in the government which the average person has not the slightest cognizance of. Well, what, what about the technology, uh, Al? If they, uh, surely in the 80s, they had pretty well perfected time travel itself, then where is it today in the 90s? In use. You're saying it's in use? It's been in use since earlier than the 80s. The project at Montauk, I will get into that shortly. The project at Montauk was a special case of advanced time travel. Time travel, per se, was discovered and actually functional in 1944, both in the United States and in Germany. The Germans had a system earlier than 44, which they were using. And there is some documentation on that, but not very much. But they were working on it also. And I might also add, they were working on an, their own project in visibility involving submarines. And they had one disaster after another, and they abandoned it also. And uh, that essentially was the story of project invisibility at that time. Well, you have then quite an extensive knowledge about some aspects of time travel, and I want to ask you about one of them. Okay. You know, the old business about if you go back and disturb something, or if you go back and, for example, kill somebody who would later have borne you, you could literally uh, extinguish yourself. That was a uh, test was attempted by, I understand, the Navy itself in 1973, and they had the same idea, go back, kill the father of a person they wanted to eliminate, Yes. Before he married, yes. the son was born by his wife. Yes. And they did, I understand, go back and uh, extinguish the life of that gentleman uh, before he married. But nothing happened to the son in the present era. It's present era speaking of the 70s. Huh. And they went back to the physicists. Okay, what's wrong? And what they came up with, and it's a fairly good explanation, I believe, namely with quantum physics, you have to look at time also as being quantized. They said all you did was disturb the time quanta in the area you visited. You didn't disturb the time quanta in the period following. Therefore, you didn't change anything except in the area where you visited. Now, that is essentially true, so far as I understand it, but Montauk was a special case, and there is a special case involved here, and I'll have to go into that in a little bit, wherein if you disturb not one reality, but you make changes in all seven realities that we know exist, right. then you have a different story and a different case. Montauk was capable of doing this. Well, I was sent back to 1927, my first memory, quite aside from the birth certificate, and how they arranged this, I don't know, but my first memory was in Christmas of 1927, sitting on Mother's grand piano, a little tyke next to the Christmas tree, sitting on that piano, and the family and friends were around exchanging Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. One of the strange things about it was, at an age of essentially one, I understood virtually all the conversation was ongoing there around that piano with the various people. There were blackouts in certain areas. I understood the language long before I was willing to talk. And as I grew up, I knew nothing of my past. I had fleeting memories during my teen years of other things, and I had no idea what they were, and they would blank out. When I went in the Navy a second time as Al Bielik in 1945 during World War II, I came out in 46, and I was again in electronics, but only as a uh, seaman, a uh, petty officer, rank, not an officer. Uh, I knew when I came back to 40, late 46 and 47 that I didn't belong in that family, but that was just a gut feeling. I had no other reason to believe that. I gave you one up through the years, went to school, became an engineer, consulting engineer, were 19... 58 to 1988, and retired in 1988. During that period, I met a lot of people. I had an extremely strong interest in the whole Philadelphia experiment, uh, philosophy, ideas, the stories that were written and told about. I didn't know why I was so fascinated by it until I saw that movie in 1988, January. So it was, on, it was kind of on the edge of reality for you at that point? That is a good way to put it. Now, one other thing happened, of course, during that period of time. I met Ivan Sanderson. He had a great interest in the subject. He tried to get information out of the Navy, in spite of the fact that he had been a former intelligence officer in the British intelligence service and had good connections with the Navy, they wouldn't tell him anything either. He died in 1973. And uh, during this period, I became involved with a group called the United States Psychotronics Association. And in 1983, at one of their meetings in Portland, Oregon, I met Preston Nichols. In 1985, at their meeting at Dayton, Ohio, he brought with him his new lab assistant, because he not only worked full-time, he had his own private lab, Duncan Cameron. And I didn't know him from Adam at that point. But in the course of that meeting... In the four days we were there, 
I talked with him at great length in the cafeteria, and after about an hour of this discussion back and forth, I finally got this funny gut feeling I knew him from somewhere. And I finally asked him, says, hey, do you have a feeling you know me from somewhere? He says, yeah. Do you have any idea where from? He says, I don't have the slightest idea, but I know I know you from somewhere. And I had the same feeling. Well, before the convention broke up, uh, Preston had invited me to visit him at his lab in Long Island at some time in the future, and uh, I did a month later in August when my job as a consultant ended that I was on. And uh, he took us out to Montauk uh, after I was there, expecting to be a weekend. It was a two weeks. Montauk, Long Island, to see this derelict base where we walked on. So all this old electronic equipment lying around in the buildings and various places, and an abandoned base. Fences were down with, obviously, a military installation. Right. We did not know, including Preston, that we had all been involved previously in this project, which crashed on the night of 12 August 1983. Remember the state 12 August. Eventually, in 86, with another visit back there, and Preston and Duncan with many visits from me in the meantime, visiting the site of the crime, so to speak, does tend to re-stimulate buried subconscious memories. Absolutely. And they came back with the memories that they had been involved, and Duncan kept saying, you were involved. And I said, I don't have any memory of this. I said, I can't say I wasn't, but I said, I have no memory of it. Went on. So in May of 86, I went back out there with a crew from Phoenix where I talked about this project to, to make a major investigation of the possibility of monies being subverted by private industry into a special government project, and they wanted proof of it, and they went through Montauk. Well, they didn't find what they wanted, but nevertheless, in the process of that visit, my memory started to come back one afternoon that I had been involved in this project, detailed memories, and they kept expanding from that point on. But this was prior to the recall of the Philadelphia Experiment involvement. As I'll be like, I was involved in this project very heavily for many years. I don't know how many, but there was leakage of information from a retired, or shall I say, resigned CIA agent to Preston that I was involved from 1953 to 83 because they kept me under cover for 30 years. All right, listen now. Um, we, uh, I've got to take a break here and get a couple things done, and we've got to start taking phone calls here. Every line is lit up and okay. uh, has been for a long time. Stay, uh, stay right where you are, and we'll be right back to you, Al Bielik, the Philadelphia Experiment, and uh, more this time. Uh, I can't answer that fully because I certainly was not up on Neumann myself. But he developed the time machine that was used. I used to f have these lectures. I, I didn't find the videos because they're embedded within, like, here I'll show you, like, here's one that's, uh, again, over three hours. Montauk Survivors. This is Al Bielik with uh, um, Preston Nichols. <laughs> Preston Nichols. Uh, other uh, people. Talking about, again, uh, the aliens, the stuff that was going on on Montauk. And, and me personally, I think that's actually, again, not, I don't believe any of this, and I don't think any of us should believe any of this stuff. Again, the point is to show how the, these convincing narrative, or at least the way he presents it, Al Bielik, how it's really consistent, again, with the sort of global Great Reset, AI running the world, merging with machines, telepathic communication with machines, uh, you know, socialism, we don't own anything, we pay with credit scores. So it's funny how this sort of, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, countercultural character that's whistleblowing on his, uh, you know, his activities in reality is like, uh, you know, he's just, he's just like a, the conspiracy Klaus Schwab just saying, basically painting a world of the same, same framework. So, I don't have all the stuff on the Montauk, but this is where he talked about the men in black and how the inspiration for the men in black, because again, some of these audios are in the 90s, and so the Will Smith men in black movie had just come out, and he was talking about how this was this was part of actually uh, projects that were going on, on on Montauk, and that it's you know six stories, but then they added two stories on further underground, and they go for miles and miles, and that there's all these different species of aliens that he met and interacted with, and so... Uh, again, again, nothing that we should believe, but again, it's, it, it is funny nonetheless. And, and I, again, enjoying, enjoying my time. So again, this is sort of a relaxing stream. We're not getting into the heady theology philosophy, just kicking back again. God bless everybody. Got a few more, um, I got about a finger left of my whiskey. So hope everybody's doing well. We're, we're going to knock out a little bit longer here, and then we're going to get into the super chat. So hope everybody's enjoying their Friday night. Smash that like. And then if uh, you feel like you'd like to support, send in a super chat using the Streamlabs link or YouTube if you prefer YouTube. And I'll be getting those in just a few minutes. So God bless you all.
send you there with the early 40s technology, assuming that he wasn't already using the technology described in the Montauk books. Thanks. That's Michael in Seattle. That's a very good question. Uh, I can't answer that fully because I certainly was not up on Neumann myself, but he developed the time machine that was used, and whatever the means was, he did get me reconnected with Montauk. Uh, could be there was an automatic attraction. I can only assume that. I don't know the exact mechanics, but I did go back to Montauk more than once. And he was satisfied, and that project was discontinued, and he went on, of course, with the Los Alamos project, as well as other projects he was working on during the war years. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not know exactly why I wound up back there, but I did. All right. Uh, what I want to do now, Al, is open up the telephone lines and begin to actually let you talk to some of the people out there. Are you up for it? Sure. The first couple questions I listened to weren't that interesting, so I'm going to click forward, and then everything after I have not listened to, actually, because I, I didn't make it through the whole thing today because I was listening to a bunch of Al Bielik stuff, not this particular Art Bell conversation. So I'm going to skip forward, and therefore, then the audio will be what I haven't heard, so we'll experience it together for the first time. So let's listen to some call-ins uh, addressing Al Bielik's claims here. Even though the government still wants to deny it, they cannot anymore completely because a lot of evidence has turned up. A lot of people who were directly involved at that time, he had connections with certain government officials. Can he verify the Roswell, New Mexico incident, and whether they're alien beings? All right, thank you. Uh, do you know anything about other things like uh, Roswell, Al? Yes, I was not part of that directly, but I have read a considerable amount of material. There is ongoing research today, and I know from reading some of the English source material that the people involved, other than uh, the director appointed by the President Truman at that time, who was Vannevar Bush, his science, chief scientific advisor, included people like Dr. John von Neumann uh, and a number of other people from Harvard and elsewhere who were a scientific team to evaluate what was there and what had come down. It's quite well documented now, even though the government still wants to deny it, they cannot anymore completely because a lot of evidence has turned up. A lot of people who were directly involved at that time were now speaking out in the last five years. Okay. Well, uh, here's another question for you. This one from Tri-Cities, Washington. Did Al go back to the Phoenix Project in 1983 after reliving the preceding years, and if not, why? If so, what did he find himself? Question mark. Uh, that's from, uh, let me see, Sean in Tri-Cities, Washington. Okay. I became part of the Phoenix Project Montauk, if you want to call it that, sometime in the 60s or the 70s because it was part of an ongoing project which started in 1947 under the umbrella entitled Project Phoenix. I became involved sometime in that period of the 60s and 70s and directly in the Montauk operation about 1975, as so far as I can now estimate. And I was there as Al Bielik and was used as an engineer because I have been an electronic engineer for many years, even though I retired. My expertise was apparently used in some phases there, particularly power supply design. Other people I know were involved, but that's not the question was asked. Now, I went there in 1983, <clears throat> and the last day with Duncan as Edward Cameron and Duncan Cameron because of the Eldridge incident. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the last two days, three days of the project before it crashed in August 12, 83, I, as Al Bielik, was removed from the project and told to go take a hike. In other words, take a vacation. Yes. They did not want me there when I arrived as Ed Cameron. And the project crashed that night. That's a long story in itself. It's covered in the Montauk Project book by Preston Nichols. Uh, the factors involved in that are very involved, but the project was basically sabotaged and uh, crashed. <clears throat> I was no longer attached to it. I am no longer attached to it. Mm -hmm. The project has been revived since. In fact, as we have found out in recent months, it never really died. They just left it uh, dead on the surface and let it appear to be dead while they spent four years rebuilding and redesigning the project underground and added two more levels to the underground. There were six levels originally. There are now eight levels underground at Montauk Point and it extends the bottom two levels extend for miles. So they did resurrect the project and went back online in 1987 for apparently new usages and purposes. We don't yet know the whole story. And the power output was up and fantastically from the levels which they were using in the 80s. What do you, what do you, what do you think uh, they're presently utilizing time travel for, Al? Presently, time travel has been used or looking into the future to see, in terms of politics, what's going to happen in terms of economics, what may happen, but more specifically in terms of earth changes, which everyone who's looked at has been predicting, and I don't mean uh, psychics, but even geologists who are looking at it and realizing we're due for some very nasty earth changes. Uh, they're all looking into the future to see what is going to happen and what does happen. Yeah. There's your climate change. I'm still trying to figure out what's going to happen with whitewater. <laughs> All right, uh, let's let's go back to phones quickly. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Al Bielik. Hello. 
Hello, I think I've got to figure it out, Art. We're going to send Char Charlie back into time to the Eldridge, hopefully enmeshed in a block yet. Boy, I'll tell you, there's an idea. Welcome to the program. Where are you calling from? This is Mike in Renton, Washington, KBI oh, Country. Good, Mike. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Mr. Okay. Bailey. Yes. Uh, I heard you before on, uh, uh, when you were here in Seattle, I guess, on Journeys with uh, Bar uh, Brenda Roberts. Yes. And uh, her husband has passed away since then, by the way. Yes, I know. And uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to ask you, I heard uh, Preston also. And if, as I remember the story, it seemed like, uh, I think I heard this from Preston now, that there was a, some kind of machine or computer at Montauk that they, they tried to secure the power to, but apparently the computer or machine wouldn't allow that to be done. Uh, the whole system at Montauk in the last uh, day there developed its own strange capability. When they knew things were going awry, when this monstrosity that looked like a Sasquatch was tramping around the grounds in the last hours, uh, picking up people and throwing them against concrete walls and trying to break into the radar tower itself, they knew they had to shut the whole system down. First they went for the power switches. They were frozen like on the Eldridge. Then they went and cut cables underground with torches two sets of power feed cables, and they, even though the lights went out, the transmitter kept running. Al, I want to ask you a question, uh, stop you right there, because I wanted to ask it the last time. Okay. When, uh, when the switches became frozen, and when uh, there were arcs going on that you described of uh, incredible voltage, yeah. um, that implies that a source outside your source was uh, feeding power almost wildly uh, to this equipment, keeping it going. Any idea what that source is? At the time that that occurred on the Eldridge, there was no source internal area there which could have caused that problem. We had probably already made the transition into hyperspace, and when you make that transition, strange things happen. It probably was not normal electricity, but a form of etheric energy which appears like electrical energy. And the switches being frozen, we cannot explain, not to this day. All right. Uh, caller, anything well, else? One, one last question. Uh, I think I heard this was from Preston also. It could have been from you. Uh, did you see aliens at Montauk? Because I heard that they were involved with Montauk with the time travel experiment. All right, we'll hold it there. Any little green guys, uh, Al? Uh, little green guys, big green guys. There were a lot of aliens there. Reptilians, leverons, greys, and uh, a number of other types who were there strictly as observers. Holy mackerel. There was a lot of technology, the very advanced technology on how to construct a time tunnel, which means to be able to travel through space and time simultaneously was beyond our technology in terms of the theory. That was provided by the aliens. It was a joint operation known by those who were running the project. And they provided part of the technology. They knew we could build the equipment, but they knew we did not know the theory, and they gave it to us. The reason they did it was because they had their own agenda, which was used on the Montauk project. You're getting into so many more aspects of this whole story uh, this time, Al, that you did not get into last time, and my mouth is hanging open. Uh, we're we're going to take a break. We'll come right back to you. Uh, <laughs> this is Al Bielek. It is the Philadelphia Story Plus. Back now to Al Bielek. Al, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, good. We've only got a few minutes before the top of the hour. Next hour, we'll uh, absolutely take a lot of calls. Let's go to the wild card line. You're on the air with Al Bielek. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes, sir. This is Charlie up in Reno again. Hello, Charlie in Hello. Reno. Yes. I'm the one that sent you the tape several months ago about the uh, other stealth ship. Yes. That I'm not, uh, been just fascinated with the show tonight. I've got a couple questions on the uh, to Mr. Bellick. Yes. About uh, the rotating fields on on the in, on the uh, transmitters. If, if you was to cross south of the equator, would would the rotating field need to go clockwise instead of counterclockwise? Um, I know it sounds a little stupid, but no, yeah, it I, doesn't. I, it does not sound stupid. Um, it does not sound stupid. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We are so woefully short of time here toward the top of the hour that I'm going to ask you to. Is it possible for you to hold on, sir? Sure. All right. I'll hold. All right, very good. Then, then hold on. I really shouldn't have gotten into that. Uh, let me put you on hold, and uh, we'll get back to you in a moment. Only time to tell you, if you want a copy of this program, and it's been going on now for three hours with Al Bielik, here's how to get it. Are you ready? Do you have a pencil? Because I, I want to get this number out because I'm going to be driven nuts if I don't. To order copies of this tape 24 hours a day, you can call area code 503-664-7969. Let me repeat that. Area code 503-664 of them, but we'll try and get to as many as we can this hour. Everybody wants to know, including the people over at Safety First who are going to order one, how to order a tape of this program. The number to call again is area code, and you can call it now, 24 hours a day, and order a tape. Area code 503-664-7966. That will include the first two hours not heard everywhere with a lot of the technical explanation of how this occurred. Area code 503-664-79. Keep you alive. 
antenna? Yes. We're uh, rotating counterclockwise? Yes. I was wondering, if you was to take the ship and go south of the equator, would the fields have to rotate clockwise in order to achieve the same effect? All right. Basically, that is probably true because you have a different field effect in the southern hemisphere uh, in terms of uh, magnetic fields. The, I don't know if you're familiar with the block wall phenomena. The magnetic fields of the Earth, like in a bar magnet, do not run straight from North Pole to South Pole. There is an intermediary point where they do a transposition number, and the North Pole field is not the same as the South Pole field. They are independent, but it's a very long and difficult explanation, and the theory on this can be proven. There have been books published on it. This is not what they teach in the textbooks. All right, and now, why did they leave you alive, Al? Okay, they had to leave me alive, as well as Duncan. They had to uh, resurrect him, so to speak, for a simple reason. We had gone through the entire time loop, and one of the gentlemen who worked on this project, uh, Dr. Norman Levinson, who has four or five books out in mathematics, he was a professor of math at MIT, died in 76, if I remember correctly. Uh, he showed in the classified work he did, which was the time equations and the time matrix, that when you rip a hole in space-time, which is what occurred when they locked up the two experiments from 43 to 83 on the 12th of August. The 12th of August is significant. I'll get into that in a minute. But when you do that, you tear a hole in space-time and the fabric of space-time. You create a problem. If those who are familiar with electrical theory and know about uh, transmission of RF energy down the transmission line, you must terminate that line and its uh, proper impedance at the end where you are attempting to ship power. That's right. If you do not have the correct terminating impedance, you get reflections back to the source. Absolutely. It's waves. That's correct, yes. That's Same thing happens in time. Mm -hmm. You rip a hole in there, with abnormal uh, rupture as it is, you no longer have a smooth flow of time because there is a flow. You have a definite problem, as many problems were created by that lockup, but one of the things that occurs is after 83, this equation shows that it takes 20 years for the disturbances to damp down to the point where they don't have to worry about it. In other words, in the year 2003, 12 August, it's, it's essentially all over. For some reason, reasons not known to either Duncan or myself, and I don't know who we, if anyone knows the answers, Duncan and I act as human dampers on the time trail, so to speak, to maintain a damping coefficient of some type so that the whole thing doesn't go off and rupture again. And so we are going to leave it there. Guys, I will share this link again if you guys want to watch the rest of this video of Al Bielik's appearance on the Art Bell Show, Coast to Coast. It sounds like a lot of us kind of used to listen to Art Bell and go down the conspiracy rabbit holes a little frequently. And so um, it was a good trip down memory lane this evening. And I had a lot of fun, again, sipping some whiskey, hanging out with y'all. Fun little Friday night, you know, relaxed, kind of enjoying, uh, again, the, the sort of nonsense. It's, it's so funny, right, to think about how so many of us used to listen to Art Bell, the Coast to Coast, the, the conspiracy stuff. And now we listen to somebody like an Al Bielik who was on there, who we may have been convinced by back in the day. But now it's laughable. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is part of, you know, you might as well work for the World Economic Forum. And so it's like it's funny how some of us. In a way, we are still the conspiracy theorists, right? We're, we're, we're the non-stabby, you know, didn't get the jibby-jab, realize what's going on. They're taking the economy. They're inflating the money. They're stopping domestic production of all goods around the world. And so we get the game, and yet we're still called the conspiracy theorists. And yet when we look back then at, you know, one of the most prominent conspiracy theorists, Art Bell and, you know, his great show Coast to Coast, on the, and maybe some of it they got right. You know, some of the conspiracies they got right, but then we hear somebody like Al Bielik, and it's like, it's so obvious, the predictive programming, it's so obvious how the whole framework leads us towards the presuppositions of the AI world, socialism, decrepit, you know, the North America's devastated, no longer exists. Um, so, it's, anyways... I thought it was going to be a fun, a fun little experience. So I hope you guys enjoyed it well. Based on the likes, we got 121 likes. If you guys are still here, smash that like. If you haven't, uh, based on the likes, it seems like a, a, again people really enjoyed tonight's stream. Kind of just hanging out, um, chit chatting, and enjoying each other's company while we listen to some good old Art Bell. You know, some Al Bielik. Gosh, it's so crazy how much I was into that stuff. And again, you know, I think the Protestant, the Western European, Western Christianity, it's like we're devoid of mysticism so much that, you know, stories about time travel, stories about uh, the indigo children, stories about 
aliens and super technologies, all this stuff sort of remystifies the world to a degree. And, and I think that's part of it. it. It lures you into the Marvel comic book world. It lures you into this sort of fanciful science fiction world, the Isaac Asimov and, and PKD world. And so we have to be a little bit conscientious but uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me is the irony, right, of that we're, we're still the conspiracy theorists. We're still, you know, the, the, the demeaning names they would have called Art Bell and, and Al Bielik. And now we would have looked at Al Bielik's story and be like, dude, you're part of the, you're part of the thing. Um, so anyways, guys, let's get into the first super chat here. Again, God bless everybody. Really, really appreciate all the support. And I got to say, the first one comes from the... The Genghis Khan, shout out to Genghis Khan, continual supporter of the stream. Genghis Khan, God bless you, brother. Your your 999 super chats, continual support, man. Thank you so very much. I really, really appreciate that. Again, and no comment. And he did it twice tonight, twice. So I'll hit Genghis Khan again, but God bless you, brother. Thank you so much for the 999 super chat. Next one comes in from Paul, says... I'll stop wearing flip-flops when you button up your short. Hashtag you can't stop us. <laughs> well, Paul, um, fair enough. Although I would rather be caught with, uh, with my shirt on than your flip-flops on. But hey, to each their own. To each their own, brother. You know, I saw some of your, your the flip-flop apologists come out uh, when the shots were fired last stream. And I got to say, you know... They're, the main argument was, well, Jesus wore flip-flops, you know, they were, well, they didn't have iPhones, you know, we're in the 21st century now, so, um, you know, I recommend, I recommend just wearing something that covers your toes, it's a little classier, you know, nobody looks at a guy with flip-flops and says, man, that guy's really serious, he, he, he's a serious dude, but, you know, I'm teasing, Paul, God bless you, bro, thank you so much for the $5 super chat, God bless you and your flip-flops, and your cargo shorts, and your new balances. I, I appreciate it all. So God bless you, Paul. God bless your family, man. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, and, and, and funny funny super chat, man. I appreciate that. Hashtag you can't stop us. I love it. God bless you, Paul. Uh, next super chat comes from Spring Breakfast. Throws in $20. Thank you so much, Spring Breakfast, for the $20 super chat. Says, what do you know about the ELCA and other subverted Christian organizations? The ELCA, I'm not too familiar with the ELCA. What is the ELCA? ELCA. Okay. Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Oh, well, I mean, all the, all the Protestant churches are subverted. So um, Spring Breakfast, you know, uh, I, I assume that you're super chatting. You know, I'm an Orthodox Christian, and so... I think uh, it's all subverted. Even in orthodoxy, they're trying to subvert it. It's just that in, within orthodoxy, there's a fraction that still holds to the traditional, original, true teaching. And so that's why I think it's so important that we learn our faith, learn theology, especially as men, so we can lead our families spiritually, and stay on that right side. Because, you know, if, if we're in the end times, who knows? But the church is going to fracture. And so we got to make sure when the orthodox church fractures that we... We stay on the always where the right theology is. You know, it may continue to fracture, but we got to stay in the right group, and then we we do that by knowing our uh, we do that by knowing our our theology. So, you know, um, I consider a lot of these groups subverted, but I get your point. You know, I I don't know much specifically about the Lutheran Church in America, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Um, to me, if it's Protestant, it's already you know gene wearing. Uh, Air Force Ones, rock, you know, electric drum set, um, or it's, you know, just morally subverted, culturally subverted. So I, I, I'm sorry, brother, I don't know much about the e ELCA, but I do uh, recognize that the, a lot of subversion going on in Christian organization. You can look, even look at the Hillsong group, right? And what, what, go, what went on with all their uh, sexual uh, indiscretions. So real problem it's a definitely a real problem but thank you so much spring breakfast god bless you brother thank you very much for the super chat uh next one comes from jerry of exposing powerful lies throws in five dollars thank you so much jerry god bless you brother hope life is going well he says i'm really loving this stream brother 
Let's do more of these late night, laid back streams soon. Super fun. Keep killing it, homie. We all love Coda. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. I really appreciate that. With the $5 super chat, God bless you, brother. We love your channel. Yeah, you know, and I enjoy it too. I, I've got to start thinking of some old like videos, old topics that aren't copyrighted that we can just sit and watch together, you know, some of these Friday nights because to be honest, sometimes it's a little exhausting to come up with my, my normal content where I do a deep research into something and have to read for hours and I just didn't have the energy today. And as I was like trying to think about a stream topic, I, I couldn't think of one. I had, I had a couple, I was thinking I could do one on psychological, um, cathartic, uh, psychological occurrences, which I think the, I was going to talk about the Trump raid at Mar-a-Lago a little bit there. And then I thought about, well, maybe I would do a stream on how to make your life a meaningful adventure. And so, Give some, you know, based on a couple conversations I've had the last few weeks on one on ones, talk to people about tips that I would, I've implemented in my own life that I think make my life more meaningful and sort of add that edge of adventure, that unknowableness, but at, at the same time, that sort of excitedness uh, to your life. But I was like, nah, you know, I don't want to get up here and sort of, you know, tell people on a Friday night about, you know, how to make their life an adventure. And I was like, you know what? And then I was thinking, like, what what can I talk about that maybe some people wouldn't know? And I thought, Al Belik, do you know? But I wonder how many of these Orthodox people even dove down the Al Belik rabbit hole. And then, turns out, a lot of us did. So, uh, so that was the kind of impetus for tonight's stream. So, Jerry from Exposing Powerful Life, I'm glad you liked it, brother. God bless you, man. Next super chat comes from Groiper Schwab. And says, we heard what you said about us. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Groiper Schwab says, we heard what you said about us. You will drink the jockey milk, and you will eat the chicken nuggies, and you will be happy. Oh, my gosh. Groiper Schwab just hit me with the ultimate Groiper threat, which is drinking the chalky milk and eating the chicken nuggies. So, uh hilarious i wonder who that is i have no idea who that would be <laughs> i have one guess i have one guess uh and he he may be a gym bro um out out in the mountain states but uh that's hilarious that is absolutely hilarious thank you so much groiper schwab uh for uh, the five dollar super chat that you know, and I, I did. I said a few nasty little things about the Groipers, about their chicken nuggies and their chalky milk. So Schwab, uh, Groiper Schwab has come back in vengeance with the $5 Super Chat to let me know that he is aware that I said uh, disparaging remarks about chalky milk and chicken nuggies. And they are going to forcibly make me drink it and eat it, and I will be happy. Well... You know what? I actually like chocolate milk and chicken nuggets, so I'll do it. But it's not masculine. I still stand my ground. <laughs> so God bless you guys. Hope everybody's doing well. Whoever Groiper Schwab is, I don't even know who that is. Um, but uh, God bless you, whoever it is. I appreciate the super chat. Next one comes from Theoria Zone. Throws in $5. Shout out to Theoria Zone. God bless you and the family, brother. Hope you're doing well. And, he's, and he throws in uh, a $5 super chat that says, thanks for the trip down memory lane. And exactly. It, it, you know, listen to Art Bell. It is a trip down memory lane, no doubt about that. And so I enjoyed it as well. You know, it's sort of a relaxed stream. I had a lot of fun. Um, I'd, I wouldn't mind doing more of these. Maybe watching like uh, old, old thing, un, uncopyrighted stuff. Maybe uncopyrighted old movies we can do and watch live and chit chat and have some drinks and, and just, uh, oh my gosh, not another one. What is with these? Gosh, I don't know if you guys are seeing the nude HD XYZ adult, best adult dating site. These are dragons. These are absolute dragons that we have to slay. What are they doing? Diving into our chat. So um, got that out of here. But anyways, Theoria Zone, thank you so much, brother, for the $5 super chat. And you are more than welcome. I enjoyed it as well for the... Uh, the, quit, the trip down memory lane, I appreciated it, and I'm glad you guys liked it as well. Shout out to everybody. Um, oh, Made by Jim Bob throws in 19. Shout out to Jim Bob. Jim Bob, we got to do a stream together over here. Uh, it's been about two weeks. I think we do one every two weeks. Or, I mean, uh, two months, I'm sorry. 
It's been about uh, two months. I was just on Jim Bob. Shout out to Jim Bob and his channel. Make sure you're following over on Jim Bob's channel. He he does live streams every business day, Monday through Friday. So um, uh, so make sure you're following him. God bless you and the family, Jim Bob. Thank you so much, man. We gotta we gotta do a stream over here on something. I'll, I'm gonna DM you. I'll come up with a topic. Uh, we got to do another stream here soon. God bless you, brother. Hope you and the family are doing well and the beautiful children. Um, yeah, any, he, Jim Bob says anytime. Let's do it, bro. Uh, I will reach out to you about setting up something. I'll come up with a, uh, with a good topic, but, uh, but yeah, that, uh, Genghis Khan throws in nine ninety nine. So shout out to Genghis Khan throwing in another nine ninety nine and and Jim Bob with the nineteen ninety nine says get some super chats going support well thank you so much made by Jim Bob man thank you so much and and shout out to Posh you know I don't know if you guys watched Posh Redneck had a debate last night with Casimir and that was a little bit difficult to watch for me um, and, and and God bled Casimir I, I, he didn't seem like an ill intended guy he didn't seem mean. He seemed like he genuinely believed what he, he thought, but the whole debate was sort of nauseating. Um, it seemed like that points, they're basically talking past each other. I thought Posh did a great job. I thought, shout out to Posh, I thought he did such a good job with the debate, keeping his composure, and um, basically just hitting him with the fact that, bro, like the debate was whether if Christian right-leaning libertarianism is compatible with Christianity. Well, the point is, and this is what I would have made if I was posh, is that libertarianism is a, is a sort of um, it's a sort of parasitic ideology because it's not a complete paradigm in and of itself. And so the idea that he's coming on there to talk about libertarianism and how it's compatible with Christianity and then and then, uh, well, you know, we don't do morals and we don't make moral claims and we allow homosexuals and all this stuff. But 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 if you if you said people had to leave nicely, then then you can allow that. It's like, bro, like, why are you so obsessed with libertarianism? You just admitted that all it deals with is this little aspect. And then religiously, this whole paradigm can deal with all those aspects, including understandings about that stuff. Like, so, but I think Posh did a good job, highlighted the, you know, the absence of moral and ethical value structures with libertarianism. And ultimately, it's unnecessary. There's no need, there's no reason to be, um, you know, there's no reason to be libertarian and be Christian. Just be Christian. Like, what the hell? Like, it's all there. So, anyways, thanks again, Jim Bob. God bless you, brother, and God bless Posh Redneck. Uh, next super chat. God, a few of them came in here. Awesome. Shout out to Edward. Throws in nine ninety nine. Says I appreciate your perspective and content, bro. God bless. Well, thank you so much, Edward, for the nine ninety nine super chat. God bless you, bro. Thank you very, very much for the kind words and the support. And thanks for being here, man. Uh, really appreciate that. God bless uh, God bless Edward. Next one comes from Frankie D. Shout out to Frankie D. Met Frankie D in Montana. Love Frankie D. Frankie D says, uh, throws in $10, says, hey, bro. What up, Frankie D? What's up, dude? I'm going to be making some financial changes here soon. And I might just do the 25 a month subscription and try to make some of the Zoom calls. Won't be able to catch as many of the streams, but want to continue to support. God bless you, brother. Well, thank you so much, Frankie D. Dude, we would love to have you in the premium members group, bro. Again, we meet twice a month. We have the best conversations. It's, uh, it's not recorded. Private group. We're able to share our own personal opinions. It's people who get it, right? We're all in the know. Um, so... It's a great group of guys and gals. There's women also in the premium members group. Um, and we have great conversations and great goings and backs and forth. And that's twice a month. So, Frankie D., if you're able to join, you know, I would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, and then you can hang out with us, in, you know, in the premium members group and catch in on some of our conversations. You know, there's been a couple streams that actually respond due to uh, conversations in the premium members group. So, I would love for you to join, Frankie D. Uh, hope you and the family are doing well, bro. And congratulations on the financial changes. Uh, maybe that sounds like... Uh, um, I, I can't tell if I when you say I'm going to be making some financial changes here soon. 
I might just do the 25 a month. I don't know if that's an improvement in financial conditions um, or what. But um, but uh, anyways, God bless you, man, and, and thank you very much. Next one comes from Keenan. Shout out to Keenan, guys. And the 499. Did you guys, hey, did you guys, again, see the intro here, the new intro? You know, make sure you check out our new intro. Like we, I played most of it. Basically, 95% of it was a played on the way in. Make sure you check out the new intro. You know, very good stuff. Two new songs, Where I'm At and Distance by Keenan. Brand new bangers. Distance isn't even out yet. So if you're watching Distance on my intro, that's not even out yet. You're ahead of the curve here. You know, you're you're in with the in group. So, um, so shout out to Keenan. Throws in 4.99. He says, if you have to eat out, what's your go-to fast food restaurant? Also, you should have a you should have Posh on. I was thinking about having Posh and Jim Bob on. Then maybe that's the next stream. It's just Posh and Jim Bob and I. And we talk about, I don't know, whatever. But um, okay, Keenan asks a serious question here. If I have to eat out, what's your go-to fast food restaurant? And that's an easy one for me. That's a very easy one for me. It's Jimmy John's. It's Jimmy John's because I know it's not greasy. Um, it's fairly, you know, compared to fast food, it's fairly clean. You can double up the meat. You know, you can get like get yourself like I, like today. I was in a crunch, needed something quick, just hit a, a nice chest workout. Hey, I'll do a beach club with the turkey with the avocado, nice clean fat there. Throw on the bacon too. And then hit that with a 60 gram protein shake. You know that's not a bad little little something. Now again, it's fast food. It's not ideal. It's not a steak. It's not a, not your you know your normal stuff. But Jimmy John's is it, it's clean. If you got to do fast food, that's probably you're going to be your cleanest option. I would say Jimmy John's is probably going to be your cleanest option. So, um, but yeah, I'm definitely down to have pa posh on. I got to have posh on. That'd be a lot a lot of fun. Next super chat comes from B Love. B Love throws in five dollars and says, <clears throat> um, "It's my birthday this weekend. This was such a pleasant surprise. It was great to be with everyone. Please pray that I make it to my baptism soon." Well, B Love, God bless you. Uh, I'm so glad that you uh, that you were here and you're sharing your birthday with us. So you know, I should give you five dollars for your birthday. The fact you're giving me five dollars for your birthday, I you know. I'm embarrassed. I'm blushing. Well, thank you so much, you know, for the super chat and God bless you. Happy birthday. Everybody in the, in the chat, everybody in the live chat right now, hit her with a happy birthday. Happy birthday to be love. One of our beloved members in the live chat. It's her birthday weekend and she is on her way to baptism. Well, I will definitely be love. Can you give us your actual Christian name or whatever your, you know, Keep your anonymity, but if you can give us your Christian name, it's it's hard. Technically, we're not supposed to pray for be love. We're not supposed to pray for handles. We're supposed to pray for names. So if you can hit us with your uh, Christian name, I will absolutely be praying for you up to your baptism. Um, so, uh, so God bless you, be love. Hope everything is well. Let us know what your name is, too, so we can pray. Next super chat is from is human milk vegan throws in fifteen dollars is human milk vegan God bless you thank you so much thank you so much is human milk vegan with the fifteen dollar super chat says for your information I'm also a time traveler that other guy was totally lying he didn't even mention how you need those quantum magnet bracelets from the nineties to start the radar entanglement crystal matrix machine. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious oh what a good what a good super chat shout out to is is human milk vegan that is hilarious that is hilarious uh catherine guys pray for catherine pray for catherine be love her christian name is catherine pray for catherine and her baptism and her journey to baptism and her spiritual illumination uh keep her in your prayers Say, keep keep catherine in your prayers 
And so a, a hilarious, hilarious super chat by his human milk vegan says, for your information, I'm also a time traveler. And that other guy was totally lying. He didn't even mention how you need those quantum magnet bracelets from the 90s that start the radar entanglement crystal matrix machine. <laughs> God bless uh, is human milk vegan, man. Really, really appreciate all your support. And thank you for the $15 super chat, man. Really appreciate it. Frankie D throws in another $5. Dang, Frankie D says, it's like, should I spend 25 a month on Hulu and Netflix or support my base bros who put out righteous content? I need to cut back, but I spend money on, in my opinion, worthless worldly content. So I'd rather divert that into positive entertainment. Well, Frankie D, I would greatly appreciate that. Again, $25, you get the, the two meetings a month that you can make. And also, um, you'll be able to get, have access to the exclusive video library, which I'm going to be doing le a video lecture series soon and all types of stuff for, for members. So um, I would greatly appreciate it, brother. If you decided to do that, God bless you. And I would greatly, greatly thank you for that. But uh, I understand. I understand the monthly subscription stuff. It's hard to deal with. But, uh, you know, if, if that's something you're interested in, man, God bless you. I would really, really appreciate it. I'll share the link here. Uh, it's just at the uh, register uh, section of my website, and that is right there. So God bless you, Frankie D. Thank you so much, man, for all the support. You've been a continual supporter of the stream. And then uh, last and final super chat comes from my Montanica roommate. Yes, I shared an Airbnb with this man in Montana, and we joined, We enjoyed rather a beautiful evening in, in a June uh, summer night there in Butte, Montana, inside of a hot tub. So uh, this is uh, that is Nick Offender throws in four ninety nine. Nick Offender throws in four ninety nine and says, "Okay, but what fast food when it's eleven thirty seven and you've got the drunchies?" Okay, well I haven't had the drunchies at eleven thirty seven in a while, but if I had the drunchies, if I'm going to just totally cheat cheat on my meals. And, I, and I'm going to get fast food, and it's late. I'm probably going to go with Taco Bell. I mean, what else do you go with? You go with Taco Bell. You get the Baja Blast. You get, you know, you know I like the cinnamon, tweet, uh, the cinnamon twist. They don't have the Mexican pizzas anymore, which I don't know what Taco Bell is thinking with getting rid of the, me the Mexican pizzas. But even, even without, I'd still go back to Taco Bell uh, if I'm drunk. Now, I'm going to regret it. Just like most most sins, after you get done, you regret it. And the same would be true with the Taco Bell, but that's probably where I would go. So, uh, and, and shout out to Jim Bob in the comment section. Say, there we go. This is support. Prop what's good. Well, thank you so much, Jim Bob. God bless you, man. I really, really appreciate your support. God bless you, man. Um, yeah, Taco Bell, Annie. Don't... Uh, don't don't judge don't judge but anyways guys i got to give a special shout out again special shout out to made by jim bob for 20 dollars super chat tonight special shout out to um spring breakfast for another super 20 dollars super chat special shout out to nick offinger special shout out to 20 dollars from frankie d special shout out to is human milk vegan Special shout out to Be Love and happy birthday to Catherine. Pray for Catherine on her journey to her baptism. Um, shout out to Keenan. Keenan Beats. Guys, make sure you check out and support the new intro we just put together. We put a lot of effort and energy into that. So please appreciate that and like that. Shout out to Edward. Shout out to Genghis Khan. Continual support. Another $20 supporter. Thank you so much, Genghis Khan. Shout out to Theoria Zone. Shout out to Groiper Schwab. Shout out to Exposing Powerful Lies. Shout out to Spring Breakfast. Shout out to Paul. Shout out to AJ. And that looks like that's everybody. Well, guys, God bless you all. Really, really appreciate it. Um, um, yeah, people, let's see how pe the, the, the Taco Bell's going over in the live chat here. It says, Mexican pizza coming back, I heard, but fourth meal is a good choice. Yeah, Mexican pizza was always my favorite. Oh, my God, I have the food channel on right now, and some dude was just talking about Taco Bell. Used to have a Mexican pizza. Whoa, time travel. Yeah. Well, you're entering into the vortex, Annie. You're entering into the vortex. I actually have the uh, Al Belix machines right over here. 
<laughs> so, uh, uh, Alex Sin says, you bring an awesome perspective, some great content for us. Thanks so much for the work you do, man. Well, thank you so much, Alex Sin. Uh, Annie, B Annie says, Taco Bell is Vox's favorite too, so you're okay. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Yo quiero Taco Bell. That's right, fallen student. Uh, again, I do not eat that stuff regularly. I don't eat I don't eat fast food regularly, other than Jimmy John. Jimmy John's the only one that I'll eat. If I'm in a time crunch when I got like things I got to get done, I'll I'll just do Jimmy John because it's clean and it's easy and it's simple. But but uh, yeah, if I'm if I got the drunchies as Nick Offinger is trying to get me to answer, yeah, I'm just gonna go all I'm gonna go like a twenty dollar order at Taco Bell with like all everything, you know. Supreme tacos, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the, the soft shell wrapped around the, the hard shell, everything, dude, everything. Pim Orsall says Burger King has the best hamburgers. What? Pim? I mean, at least they are charbroiled. Uh, if you got to go, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'd probably go with Steak and Shake before I'd go with Burger King. Burger King over McDonald's for sure. I don't need any. I haven't remembered the last time I had Burger King. I cannot remember the last time I had Burger King. Um, it's been a while. It's been it's been well over a couple of years for sure. Oh, the cheesy gordita crunch. Yes, we all know. <laughs> yes, Keenan. Yes. Ooh, Carl's Jr. Yeah, I would say Carl's Jr. or Hardee's is better than Burger King in regards to the sandwiches, the hamburgers. I'm going to have to second fallen student there. Carl's Jr. and Hardee's is a better fast food than um, – it's a better fast food than, than Burger King. But I, I'm not trying to hurt – I'm not trying – you know, no shots fired, Pim. No shots fired. They do have charbroiled. So I would say it's better than Wendy's and it's better than McDonald's. Um, but, uh, you know, you got Arby's with the roast beef, not really hamburgers – I say the steak and shake and um, is is pretty decent, but I agree. Carl's Jr. has the best hamburgers. Hardee's has the best hamburgers, so you got to go with Hardee's over over Burger King, in my opinion. So no 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 offense, Pim. Do not take that. Okay, Pim says Carl's Carl's Jr. is legit. It is. It, I would say. In and out, I have I haven't had In and Out. I've everybody close proximity to my life says In and Out is overrated. I have not had Inner Inner In and Out or What a Burger. I have not had either. Those are the old, obviously the other ones that everybody talks about. But um, oh, not gonna lie, I'll hit up a Hardy's breakfast for sure, dude. They're the biscuits and gravy platter. Like who the biscuits and gravy platter at Hardy's is the best. It's the best. Now, it's, there's like no nutritional quality to it, but that's not the point. The point is to eat like the greasy biscuit with the the gravy that they make with the little bitty chunks of like fake sausage. It's freaking delicious. Like, no, you can't beat the biscuits and gravy platter at Hardy's breakfast. Are you kidding? Yeah, Chick-fil-A is always good. Chick-fil-A is always good. I love Chick-fil-A. So Chick-fil-A is good. Not everywhere has the Chick-fil-A. Um, but yeah, Chick-fil-A, Carl's, Carl's Jr., Hardee's, it's Hardee's here in Indiana. So, uh, Hardee's, Chick-fil-A, yeah, they're legit. Sonic? David Franco Jr. coming in with Sonic? Are you serious? No. Sarah from Goose says, in and out is not overrated. The other day I got an animal style 4x4 with chopped chili peppers. Okay. That sounds good. I mean, I like Five Guys. If I'm go if we're really going to get into it, then I think Five Guys is probably the best. The Five Guys is the best I've had. So In and Out and Whataburger is going to have to beat Five Guys, in my opinion. I like Five Guys. So, anyways, we had a couple more super chats come in. Uh, again, Pim throws in the Burger King has the best hamburgers. Again, controversial in the live chat. Everybody's coming at Pim here with different different takes. And then Genghis Khan throws in another nine ninety nine. Shout out to Genghis Khan! My gosh, brother, thank you so much for the support. Shout out to Genghis Khan! Thank you very, very much. Whoever Genghis Khan is, I need to thank you. You you are just a continual, continual supporter. Thank you, bro, so freaking much. Thank you, Genghis Khan. So, 
Ooh, Sonic does have the onion rings. Prism, you came in with the real one there. Oh, my gosh. I love onion rings with ranch. Gosh, you guys are making me so hungry, and it's 1054 right now. I can't eat anything. I'm not going to eat anything, but, man, could I eat something? That is no doubt. Burger King is called Hungry Jack in Australia. I did not know that. David Frankel says Five Guys is legit. Five Guys is legit. Um, Keenan says DPH. What's the theology of hamburgers? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I guess trying to get the meat between the buns is is. I think that's what the hamburger is about: is getting the the quality meat between the buns. So. I think it's a little bit straightforward there, so I'll, I'll let you take that where you wish, Keenan. Um, but <laughs> anyways, guys, again, thank you all so much for the support. Special thank you to Genghis Khan for the support. Shout out to Pim with the, with the last ditch $2 super chat. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyways, y'all. Uh, God bless you guys. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to come back Sunday. I'll do another stream Sunday night. Oh, Nick. Nick Offender throws $4.99. And let's see what Nick, Nick's got. <laughs> and Nick says, and just like that, we're all groipers talking about nuggies. <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious. Shout out to Nick Offinger. Again, he I, I was able to meet him and room with him in Montana. Great guy. Shout out to you and the family, bro. Hope everybody's doing doing well. He says, and just like that, we're all groipers talking about nuggies. Well, we're talking about Mexican pizzas, burgers, this and that. Uh but yeah. <clears throat> David Franco Jr. says A and W. Ooh, A and W has the, the root beer. The root beer floats, bro. The root beer floats at A and W. Um, I can do a root beer float. Not frequent. I, I and last time I had a root beer float, I was a kid. Again, I don't know if you guys are familiar. You know, you put the vanilla ice cream with the root beer soda. Man. Root, you know, A and W root beer. Yes, with the onion rings, were way they were definitely greasy. Uh, the blooming onion from Outback. I just had a blooming onion from Texas Roadhouse, and it was better because it, the last time I went to Outback, it was way too greasy. Um, yeah, Orthodox potato thinks I eat Impossible Burgers. That, yeah, yeah, definitely not. Uh, shout out to Orthodox Potato. Yeah, David Franco, David Franco Jr. A and W. That brings me back to my childhood. Yes, my Indiana family always liked root beer floats. We love root beer floats. I remember, that was the thing is my childhood is is root beer floats with like mugs. My parents would have the the glass root beer mugs. Like they'd already be in the freezer, so they'd be nice and cold, chilled. Throw the ice cream in, just pour the the root beer, the A W root beer on, you know. Dang, Genghis Khan throws in another nine ninety nine. What? Whoa! Shout out to Genghis Khan. Dang. Wow, Genghis Khan, God bless you, bro. Thank you so much, man. Uh. Yeah, Texas Roadhouse. Dude, I, I just went to the Texas Roadhouse recently with family. Uh, and he says, no more foods talk. We can't take DPH, fall off the wagon. Laugh, like you're going to be dreaming of Mexican pizzas and double burgers. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You guys are making me so freaking hungry, though. Uh, that's not a joke. In the freaking two fingers of, well, three fingers of whiskey didn't hurt either. Uh, my gosh, I, I'm craving for something now. Ooh, and greasy onion rings sound great. Oh, um, jeez. 
Yeah, B Love says friends th friends don't let friends eat seed oils. Facts, facts. Again, shout out to Genghis Khan. Thank you so much, bro. Um, yes, dude. David Atkinson just nailed it. He said A and W ended when they took away the drive in with the with the window trays. Absolutely. Same with the dog and suds. You guys ever go to dog and suds? Have you guys ever been to Dog and Suds? It's another drive-in restaurant. I don't know if this is just an Indiana thing or a Midwest thing or across the U.S. thing. I don't know how big Dog and Suds was. So did any of you guys go to Dog and Suds before? <laughs> um, I remember we used to go to Dog and Suds all the time when I was a kid. Pim Orsos throws in ten dollars and says Bill Gates worm insect burgers. <laughs> yeah, coming soon. Coming to a Sonic near you is uh, the Bill Gates insect bug burger. Uh, everybody's favorite. David Franco says, "Did Jay do like three, uh, three streams today? I don't know. Is he streaming right now? I'm streaming. Is there somebody else streaming?" I don't think so. I think he streamed yesterday and he streamed today. He did debates. I think he streamed three days in a row, not three today, bro. But that reminds me, guys, go to St. Augustine. If you want to chill with me, potentially Jay and Jamie may show up. I'm going to be in St. Augustine Labor Day weekend. If you're able to go, go. Go to St. Augustine. We're going to have a great time. Never heard of dog and dog and suds. S U D Z. It's dog and suds. It was like a, it, they had like hot dogs, like different hot dogs, and then suds. I think like potatoes. I guess fries. I don't know. Or those are spuds. Uh, suds. I guess like the the cola. So, uh, so yeah. Anyways, guys, um, I'm going to hop off here. God bless everybody. Again, if you're able to make it to St. Augustine, Florida for Labor Day weekend, do it. We're going to have a ton of freaking fun. We're going to have a ton of fun. Um, and you'll be able to spend time with me, Jay, and Jamie. Again, I don't know what their schedule is, uh, Jay and Jamie. I will be available. I'll be on the beach. I'm going to be hitting the gym in the morning, catching nice meals. We can meet up. Grab a mojito, hit the beach, get some sun, enjoy, hit a nice restaurant in the evening, and that's my go. Go to get a nice nice sleep and then hit the gym again the next day. That's going to be my vacation. That's my goal in Florida. So if you want to meet up in Florida, do it. I'll be there for Labor Day weekend in St. Augustine, Florida. Anyways, I'll be back Sunday with another stream. I'm not sure what it is, uh, but hopefully it's it goes well so we'll see anyways guys god bless y'all thank you so much for everybody who super chatted pim orsolves genghis khan david franco jr nick offinger um frankie d is human milk vegan b love keenan edward made by jim bob time uh, theoria zone groiper schwab exposing powerful lies spring breakfast paul a and that and that's it so God bless you all. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody in St. Augustine. But I, if not, at least I'll see you this Sunday. So I'll see you Sunday. As always.